Good morning or good afternoon uh, to everybody. And uh, my name is Yitad Kunz. I'm together with my uh, colleague, uh, Kamal Hajian. Uh, we are the hosts of uh, the Harry Black Hole session or um, uh, Black Holes in Alternative Theories of Gravity. Um, well, in the beginning um, of for all this hairy business of black holes, we were really just uh, basically looking at uh, general relativity with uh, yeah, other fields. Now, uh, the field has moved very much towards alternative theories of gravity, where um, yeah, the presence of other fields or higher order terms or whatever also uh, gives rise to hair of black holes. And uh, this is then also what much, much of the session is about, but we'll also have some general relativity uh, talks uh, with uh, yeah, other types of fields uh, uh, in the session. So we start uh, this morning with uh, a talk by one of the real pioneers, uh, the one who uh, found the first hairy black holes uh, uh, with young Mills fields, and this is uh, Michael Falkov. He's from the University of Tours, and uh, he's talking about uh, hairy black holes and massive by gravity. Please, Michael. Okay, thank you, Jutta. So, uh, honestly, it's been uh, quite a while since I, uh, I worked on, 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 on hairy black holes for the last time, uh, but recently I had an occasion to, to to get back to to this business in the context of massive by gravity, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a moment what it is. So uh, the the history of the problem is, is this: so the massive by gravity, Gauss free by gravity, was was invented uh, ten years ago by uh, Hassan and Rosen in Stockholm. Then next year, I was able to produce uh, a year later uh, first uh, hairy black holes in this theory, but unfortunately, I couldn't find asymptotically flat solutions because some additional information needed for this, and this I didn't have at the moment, uh, at the time. But uh, a, a year later, uh, the group of, of Cardoza from, from, from Portugal uh, was able to construct such solutions. However, uh, their paper was later criticized by, by, by a Swedish group, and so it, 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 it was not really clear if they exist or not. And the last year with my student, Armand Jarval, we were able to cl clarify the situation. We, we, we confirmed the, the existence and uh, uh, really uh, uh, so advanced in the field and we established many new properties and physical applications and, and so on. So this is the, the story. Now, what is Gauss-free by gravity? This is the theory with two dynamical metrics usually called G menu and F menu. And uh, each metric has uh, its own kinetic term in the action. So there is a Einstein-Hilbert kinetic term for the metric G and also Einstein-Hilbert for the metric F. In addition, there is an interaction potential. Uh, interaction be between uh, the two metrics is described by a scalar function U which is constructed in a special way from invariance of the following tensor. One takes uh, g to the minus one times f and square root of this. And as square root is, is essential. And so this is, uh, this is a very special construction which uh, allows one to eliminate so-called boulevard diesel ghost. And the potential also contains two arbitrary real parameters. In addition, uh, the G metric uh, is coupled to uh, external matter, but F metric is not coupled. Therefore, the matter does not see F metric directly. Uh, the, uh, the geodesics, they follow, uh, the, so the, the, the matter particle follow geodesics lines of, of, the, of the metric G. Now, this theory uh, contains two gravitons in the spectrum, a usual massless graviton, and a massive graviton with, with mass m, and the m uh, appears here as a parameter. Uh, 
Well, and some people uh, say, uh, some people think that this uh, this theory is basically a theory of everything uh, uh, because it, uh, it, 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 it has many nice solutions and it describes uh, acceleration of our universe. Uh, well, of course, not everybody agrees, but, uh, but, but uh, there are serious reasons to believe that, that this is this is a good theory. Now, it's possible to hide uh, the M uh, in the length scale by rescaling Automatic in this way, uh, uh, and then uh, if one vary the action with respect to g menu and with respect to f menu, this gives two sets of Einstein equations. So it's Einstein tensor for the metric g and Einstein metric for, for metric f, and uh, on the right uh, there are effective energy momentum tensors uh, containing interactions between the two metrics. And in addition, the, uh, the, the G metric is coupled to external uh, module. Now, the theory uh, contains two gravitational couplings, kappa one and, and, and kappa two, uh, which can be made uh, dimensionless by the following uh, rescaling, uh, the exp exp uh, expressing them in terms of, of, of a mixing angle eta. Uh, okay, um, now, now flat space, is a solution. So the flat space is obtained by, 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 by the two metrics to be equal to each other and to be equal to, to, to Minkowski metric. And this is passes through equations of motion. Next, one can consider small fluctuations around flat space uh, by giving small del delta G menu and delta menu, delta F menu. And then uh, one discovers that the following linear combinations of the fluctuations satisfy uh, either linearized Einstein equations, uh, therefore they describe massless graviton, or they satisfy uh, the linear first Pauli equations, therefore they uh, uh, describe massive graviton. Now, many people uh, studied solutions of, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, equations. Uh, the, so, so there is a, it, 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 the whole industry uh, there are reviews on this and many solutions are known, cosmologists, uh, cosmological solutions, stars, wormholes, et cetera, et cetera. But the situation <laughs> with black holes was not really clear uh, until very recently. Now, uh, the simplest black holes can be obtained in the following way. If two metrics are identified, uh, they said to be equal to each other, then the interaction term vanish, vanish in the equations, and then uh, the two, the uh, both sets of, of the equations reduce to one single set of Einstein, vacuum Einstein equations. And therefore, any vacuum metric is a solution of these equations, and in particular, the Schwarzschild. And we shall call it both Schwarzschild. Well, uh, for both, because later there we will also have a Schwarzschild. Uh, for both Schwarzschild, uh, G menu is equal to F menu and is equal to. So it's exactly like in GR. However, only at, at this level, already if you consider fluctuations around this, uh, this background, then the fluctuations of G menu need not to be exactly the same as fluctuations of F menu. And then uh, one discovers that this uh, background is, uh, can be stable and unstable depending on the value of mass. So if M, M, M is large, it's stable, otherwise it's unstable. Okay. Next, uh, theory uh, admits uh, cosmological solution, just just without any matter, without anything. Uh, so if if you, if 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 you, uh, set it to zero, still there is the Sitter solution uh, describing self-accelerating universe with a, a cosmological term effective cosmological term, which is proportional to the square of the gravitational mass times kappa one. So kappa one is the first gravitational coupling. So one of the two, kappa one, this one. Now, uh, and this formula is basically the main motivation for, for considering theories with, with massive gravitons. Uh, because uh, as you know, uh, present value of cosmological constant is very small and it's very difficult to explain why lambda is so small. Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you assume that lambda is, is a composite object, is made of a, a sort of graviton mass, then it's much easier to uh, explain why graviton mass is small because a renormalization of, of, of graviton mass is, is different from a renormalization of, of a 
of a scalar quantity like lambda. And uh, so physically, uh, this one can, uh, uh, one can think that the universe accelerates because the gravitons are massive and therefore the uh, different parts of the universe attract each other according to the Yukawa law. And therefore the gravity force is screened at large distances, weaker than in standard GR. That's why uh, different parts of, of the universe attract uh, each, each other, uh, not, not, as strong, uh, not as strongly as in GR. That's why the universe accelerates. So this is the, the, the idea. But, but it turns out, uh, so some people uh, think that, that M should be, uh, M squared should be very small and, and uh, or of the order of the inverse Hubble squared. But in fact, uh, it's uh, one should rather assume that the, that the constant kappa is very small, uh, which is needed in order to remove uh, instability in the, in the cosmological solution. Solution contains instability, uh, this solution. And in order to remove it, one has to assume that the kappa, kappa one is a very small number, is of the, uh, is of the order of the ratio of electroweak energy scale, which is about 100 GV, divided by Planck's energy scale and squared. And this is of the order of 10 to the minus 34. So this is a, this is a very, very small number. So again, I repeat, there are two sets of Einstein equations and this Kaplan is of the order of 10 to the minus 34. And this is of the order of unity. This, this is the point. Uh, okay, and if you assume this estimate, th then the uh, Compton length of the graviton becomes of the uh, roughly million kilometers, which is the order of solar size. So the, 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 the gravitons are neither very heavy nor not, not very light. And with this information, uh, we, uh, so the, the, the black holes are constructed in the following way. So, so again, we have two metrics and we assume each of them to be static and spherically symmetric. And so, so this is G uh, line element is, 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 is uh, parameterized in the following way, where S, S squared is the coefficient in front of the, of the angular element. And so, so we can assume uh, R to be the special coordinate. Whereas uh, for the F metric, we cannot make the, the same assumption and, uh, and we have to leave the arbitrary function in, in, in front of the, of, the, uh, of the angular element. Now, if you want them to be black holes, we should assume that Q and N vanish at some value of the radius. And if we study equations, then uh, we discovered that the, uh, the Q small and Y should vanish exactly at the same point Otherwise, it is inconsistent with the equations. Therefore, the two metrics uh, should have a common event horizon. In other words, event horizon uh, is a null surface, which is null with respect to each metric. And then it turns out that the surface gravity and the, the, the temperature are also the same. However, the radius of the horizon measured by the first metric, Rh, need not to be precisely the same as, as the radius measured by, by the second metric, which is U of R, R, RH. And now, uh, so the independent Einstein equations boils, boil down to the system of the following three, uh, system of the of three first order differential equations. And then the, uh, the, the parameter uh, which determines, uh, completely determines initial value at the horizon is, is this value of U, uh, of, uh, of uh, Rh. So therefore, the, the, the size uh, of the horizon measured by the second metric. So this is the boundary conditions at the horizon. Now there is also infinity. Uh, at infinity, the situation is difficult because if we expand equations at infinity, uh, then schematically there is a, a decaying Newtonian mode, decaying Yukawa mode, but there is also the growing Yukawa mode. And this growing mode uh, complicates enormously numerical analysis. And once you suppress this mode from the very beginning by setting uh, this, this constant to zero, and then uh, one solves the equation by multiple shooting, for example, or by some other methods, 
But the problem is that in order to start uh, integration, one is, initial guess is needed. Uh, otherwise, iterations do not converge. And the guess is how to get it. It's, 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 it's not easy. And th this is what I couldn't do initially. But finally, the missing information came from the, uh, from the analysis of stability of this bolt fashion solution. Well, this, this solution and uh, stability analysis shows, sh analysis shows that, that the, 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 the stability, stability behavior changes for the critical value of, uh, of, of the radius. Uh, therefore, for this value, the perturbation equations per, uh, admit a zero mode. And this zero mode, uh, and this is a sign of bifurcation of this uh, solution with, with, the, with the new branch of, of Hayes solutions. And so this is, uh, and this gives the, 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 the input values for, 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 for numerical analysis. And sometimes uh, these values are called Gregory Laflamme point because in fact, curiously perturbation equations in this case mathematically are exactly the same as, uh, as, as the equations uh, studied by Gregory and, and uh, Laflamme uh, during the analysis of stability of black strings. So exactly, exactly the same equations. Now, well, but uh, after this, the next is already the matter of, uh, you, of, of, of integration and this gives hairy black holes and here are some profiles. So these are, uh, these are, uh, these are profile functions divided by the Schwarzschild uh, values. So if the, if the ratios are equal to one, then this is Schwarzschild, uh, otherwise it's not. And so we see that the ratios approach one asymptotically, therefore asymptotically everything is Schwarzschild. Whereas in, in the horizon vicinity, uh, there are deviations from Schwarzschild values, uh, and therefore the graviton hair uh, is localized in this region, uh, close to the horizon. Yeah. And so, so this we did for, 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 for arbitrary values of coupling, uh, for, for arbitrary values of for all values of, of kappa one, kappa two, just, just in order to, to span the parameter space. But now actually we need uh, only values, uh, only solutions with kappa very small. And if kappa is zero, just exactly zero, kappa one is zero, then the F metric becomes precisely Schwarzschild, whereas F metric, uh, G metric becomes Schwarzschild, whereas F metric becomes a solution on the Schwarzschild background. And uh, curiously, these solutions are very complicated. And so we integrated the metric on Schwarzschild background, and this is not, not, not easy at all. But we obtained them, of course, and then we study the stability by considering perturbations in the spherical asymmetric sector only. But, but usually if, if a solution is, is unstable, the perturbation usually lives in spherical asymmetric sector. So therefore we, we did only the sector uh, and then everything boils down to, to a Schrodinger type problem. And, uh, and then we studied negative modes of this problem. So if there are solutions, bound state solutions with, or with negative omega squared, then, then the background is unstable. And many solutions are, are effectively indeed unstable, uh, but uh, remarkably, so this, the, the hairy black holes with small values of kappa one, so which is physically interesting, are stable. And this was, this was great uh, news for us. And here is the phase diagram of, 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 of our solutions. So on the x axis, uh, axis uh, there, there is, a, there is uh, the radius of, of horizon, whereas on, on the on the y vertical axis is, is a mixed angle eta. So the kappa one is cos cos squared eta. And here the 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 uh, these dashed lines are lines of ne of of zero omega. So these are zero modes. So when we cross this line, the stability changes. Uh, so for example, solutions in this region, in this region are unstable, whereas in this region are stable. And the physical region correspond to very small values of uh, kappa one. So therefore it's, 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 it's uh, roughly this green region and this region is stable. So therefore we have stable black holes uh, living in this, um, in this region, which is very nice. Now, here are the masses. So these are masses for different values of kappa. So uh, when, we, when we fix kappa and change the event horizon, so there is the ADM mass. 
And so these are families of solutions and all of them inter intersect at the Gregory Laflamme point. And at this point, both metrics are Schwarzschild. And so everything starts here. But when we deviate from this point, the metrics are no longer Schwarzschild. However, for this red line, kappa one is zero and then the D metric is exactly Schwarzschild whereas F, F metric is not. Um, and then the, the mass for all these solutions is, it doesn't change much. So it's, 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 a, it's a, of the order of million of solar masses. But if you, if you close very close, if you stay very close to this red solution, red line for small values of kappa one, then the mass can be small. And, uh, and, and here are finally the physical solutions, I repeat. So these are solutions of these equations where kappa one is very, very small. It's 10 to the minus 34. Therefore, the G metric is almost Schwarzschild. So the deviation from Schwarzschild is, is negligible. So one cannot see directly. But uh, all the hair is contained in the F metric. F metric fulfills this equation uh, and this equation uh, uh, provides uh, non-trivial solutions. So therefore, under no, no, no normal circumstances, uh, the matter, which, sees, which can, can see only G metric, will see just Schwarzschild. Uh, and the only uh, situation, so if you consider, for example, black hole collisions, and then the deviations from equilibrium become very strong, then this, this G menu can become strong enough in order to overcome this strong suppression. Therefore, we expect uh, the hairy signatures to be visible only in, uh, in, in collisions. And so this is the summary of my results. So uh, if we assume that the, that the by gravity indeed describes physics, then it has Schwarzschild solutions and uh, hairy solutions. And all Schwarzschild solutions are unstable. So for physical values of mass are unstable in this case, and therefore they are not acceptable. We should uh, accept use instead the hairy solutions, but for hairy solutions, all the hair uh, is contained in the F metric, which is not measurable. Whereas the metric G metric is, is very, very, very close to Schwarzschild. Therefore under normal, under normal conditions, so all these black holes will behave as usual, GR black holes. And only during the uh, collisions, mergings of two black, uh, of two black holes, uh, there is a chance to detect uh, deviation from GR. And interestingly, it, it, it's interesting that the effect uh, should be stronger for smaller black holes. Because in fact, for, for, for small Schwarzschild, the, uh, the, the, the metric F uh, becomes, uh, components of metric F becomes larger and larger. Therefore, we expect the, 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 the effect to be stronger in mergers in merges of small black holes. And one can speculate that maybe the effect uh, has not been detected in LIGA by LIGA up to now only because the black holes measured by LIGA are too heavy. And if you wait some years and you, until they detect signals from the solar mass black holes or signal for smaller black holes uh, of, of, of this mass, maybe only in this case, uh, the deviations from, uh, from uh, GR will be visible. That's it, thank you. This is, uh, this is my, uh, uh, what I wanted to say. Now I can, uh, so if you, if you have questions, uh, please, uh, please do. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, okay. A very interesting talk, uh, Mikhail. And uh, yes, uh, are there questions? Uh, oops. Uh, I have uh, some questions. I, I really find this most interesting. And thinking of uh, Gregory Laflamme, we also have these higher copies. Uh, and also, when you look at scalarized uh, black holes, uh, there are these uh, really excited black holes. Do you also have such uh, excitations? So, you further zero modes uh, giving rise to new branches? Uh, in fact, uh, 
I, I think yes, but um, yeah, this is this is true that uh, that if you consider uh, uh, perturbation equations, then there are higher excitations, uh, and then which which oscillate, uh, and therefore one may, may expect to to get also black holes with uh, with, a, with the higher nodes, one node, two two nodes. But this we, we, we didn't. I think they exist, uh, but this we didn't study because 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 they're definitely unstable. As soon as something mm -hmm. starts start oscillating, of course they're unstable. So we we, we only consider the fundamental black holes, uh, which are uh, which uh, I think they're stable. Even though we didn't check the sectors of high angular momenta, uh, for example, dipole, quadrupole, etc. But I think they uh, there is a high uh, a good chance that. that, that they, they should be stable because because of, because because they're stable in the in the S channel. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I would agree because normally it's and precisely this uh, Rayleigh channel where the instabilities are sitting. Um, <clears throat> are there further questions? Uh, Ludovic. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, so once again, thank you for your for your for your talk. Uh, my question was uh, about the, the mass of the black hole. You had this nice picture about uh, how the mass evolved depending on different parameter. And if I correctly understood, you said it was the ADM mass, right? Right. Uh, did you also try to see what happened for uh, other type of mass definition, typically the the Comar mass or? Uh, also, well, uh, because in in GR we know these are the, the same, but uh, when there are deviations, sometimes they might differ, and so I was wondering what can happen to this. No, in in fact, in this particular case, I think they uh, co co coincide mm -hmm. um, because uh, because it's it's just a, a, each metric fulfills usual Einstein equations. And then when we define, define the mass with respect to each metric, so each metric uh, uh, gives the same mass. So, uh, so mass MF, AMG, they, they are the same. Mm -hmm. But they're the same as Kumar mass. And uh, they, 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 in this particular case, they, uh, they, we don't see deviations from, uh, from, from GR. But uh, interesting, uh, uh, conceptually interesting questions uh, where there might be deviation from GR, these are unstable solutions. So stable solutions are fine, mm, okay. but, but unstable are black holes. They, if they are unstable, the next question, when they start to decay, what happens to them? And uh, well, they are, uh, they are energetically, uh, they're heavier than Schwarzschild black holes. So, well, one may, one may think that, that they decay into Schwarzschild, but Schwarzschild is also unstable. And so therefore what happens next is, is completely unclear. So uh, uh, can it decay in such a way that event horizon disappears? In classical GR, such a, pro in GR, such a process is impossible. So the, the, the event horizon is, will be always there, but in bi-gravity, nobody knows. So, so yeah. nobody knows. So, so what, what does it mean? Instability of Schwarz, what it decays into. For example, instability of black, of black string in five dimensions is a very complicated phenomenon. So the black string, which, which, which is infinite, it, uh, it segmentates uh, into the infinite sequence of beats. So it's, it's, it's like a string, it, 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 it first mm -hmm. it, it, it decays into sausages and then this, so it just shrinks, and, and then uh, finally you have a line uh, and with infinitely many uh, sort of bubbles. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very complicated phenomenon. So, and, but, but this is in 5D. In, in 5D. What happens in, here in, in by gravity in, in, in 4D, nobody knows. This is, this is different. So, so, so there is an interesting conceptual question, I would say. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, thank um, you. Yes, so uh, in view of time, uh, I would uh, say let's uh, thank uh, Mikhail once more very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, then we continue with our second speaker this morning. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. So our second speaker is Aurelien uh, Barrault uh, from uh, Grenoble.
And he'll tell us uh, or give us some, an overview on uh, quaternion modes of black holes and modified uh, gravity. Thank you. You can see my screen. It's OK? Yes, it's perfect. OK, thank you very much. So uh, what I'm going to say now is uh, very simple, uh, essentially basic uh, concepts, but maybe it can uh, help us and guide our intuitions by making a kind of review of the different trains for quasi normal modes in, um, in some models of extended or quantum uh, gravity. So um, we, we know that uh, in a way, of course, black holes are very simple just because they are vacuum solutions of the uh, Einstein equations. And the quasi-normal modes are especially interesting because um, they are free oscillations and they do not depend on the details of the initial perturbations. And they don't depend either on the matter content, on the possible complicated equation of state that we can um, encounter in several astrophysical situations. So therefore, quasi-normal modes are both quite complicated at the technical level, but very simple at the conceptual level. And of course, they are not completely uh, normal, they are quasi-normal just because the system is uh, losing energy through gravitational waves. And this is especially why they are interesting to consider now in the, um, in the era of, of, of LIGO and, and, and Virgo. Uh, technically, uh, quasi-normal modes are complicated things. They can be defined as a complex pole of, uh, gr of green function. But intuitively, they are just basically the, the ring down phenomenon of, of, of black holes after a kind of merging or any kind of, um, of disturbance. So uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to study quasi-normal modes, you just have to um, add a small perturbation to the, uh, to the considered metric and to solve the uh, Einstein's equation in vacuum. And what makes them rather interesting, I would say, and rather singular in physics are, of course, the boundary conditions. Because you want the wave to be purely outgoing at infinity, just because there is no source at infinity in the problem. But you want the modes to be purely ingoing at the event horizon, just because this is the event horizon, right? So this is a strange uh, set of initial conditions when we think uh, about it from a standard physics viewpoint. And um, the, the interesting technical point is that you don't want to solve an equation. You want to try to understand when an equation has a solution. This is basically how the, the mathematical problem of quasi-normal modes is, is posed. So you find solutions that are described by an imaginary and a real part of a complex frequency. The real part, of course, is a usual frequency, and the imaginary part is basically the dumping rate. So intuitively, when this imaginary part is negative, you have an exponential damping, and therefore the solution is stable. And when it is positive, you have an exponential growth, and the solution is unstable. Uh, Actually, mathematically, the problem is not as simple. And as you know, only the, um, the stability of Minkowski space has been uh, uh, rigorously mathematically proved. But at the physical level, I think it's, uh, it's a proper guide for intuition. There is a strong analogy between uh, quasi-normal modes and uh, gray body factors, for example. That is uh, the, the problem of scattering of quantum fields in a black hole background. For example, if you try to solve the Klein-Gordon equation for scalar modes in a Schwarzschild background, you it's well known, of course, that we end up with a potential, a diffusion potential in the Schrodinger-like equation, which is not exactly, but nearly the same that the one which is encountered in the quasi-normal mode sector. So to summarize, uh, it's uh, interesting to write down the metric in this uh, form, which is completely general after a few uh, arbitrary rotations. We have perturbations that give small values to metric coefficients that were initially zero. And these perturbations uh, induce a kind of frame dragging effect, and they are called actual perturbations. And we have perturbations that give small increments to parameters that were already non-zero in the initial metric, and they are called the polar perturbations. The point is that actual and polar perturbations see very different potentials that are written then. Here, sorry, this is the Reggie Wheeler potential and this is the Zeri potential. And the very magical uh, um, point is that uh, the set of frequency is the same. This is a property called isospectrality, which is very subtle. And I will come back to that at the end. 
Uh, but you know that when, when looking at the potential, it's not completely clear that they, they share the same spectrum of problem nodes. But I think there is a transformation which uh, which brings one potential to sure. the other one. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. But but the question is 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 that it's not obvious whether this transformation remains correct, right? In with extra dimensions or with modified theories of, of gravity. So the uh, the Cosine normal modes of the Schwarzschild black hole are known for decades. Uh, I have just plotted them uh, here. This is for L L equal um, two and sorry L equal two and L equal three, and they can be uh, numerically computed up to any uh, overtone number. So uh, what I think makes the study of uh, quasi-normal modes especially uh, exciting now is, of course, uh, the, um, the detection of gravitational waves. And uh, already two years ago, uh, this uh, paper claimed that the uh, LIGO and Virgo observations of the first uh, binary uh, systems of black hole um, show evidence for the fundamental quasi-normal modes and at least one overtone, probably a second overtone at a confidence level of two sigma for the, for the, for the second one. So really, the, the physics of quasi-normal modes is now entering the, um, the uh, experimental uh, arena. So let's now try to understand what happens when we go beyond JR. Uh, I, I always want to take just 30 seconds to remind all of us, although probably you, of course, uh, already know that, that going beyond JR is not something trivial, because of course we have this very well-known Lovelock theorem, which basically says that JR is the only possibility. But for all theorems, there are hypotheses, and you can violate the hypothesis, and therefore you can go beyond JR. And I have borrowed from uh, Tessa Baker this nice uh, slide where you see all the well, not all, but some of the possible modified gravity theories. But I think it's very important that we all keep in mind that when we play this game, we violate some fundamental hypothesis. And this is, uh, how to say, the highest price to pay, a necessary price, probably, but the highest price to pay. So from now on, I'm going to give um, unphysical values to uh, the parameters entering different models, OK, because I'm just interested in trying to show the trends. So please don't ask, well, you can ask me, <laughs> but you will be disappointed by the answer. The physical values I give to the parameters are way beyond the bounds. This is just to understand how it moves, OK? So I uh, start with this uh, general uh, metric. Uh, in this case, uh, when studying quasi-normal modes, you can calculate that the effective potential that, are, that is going to be seen is this one. But you can even generalize to more general metrics where the function here and there are not the same. So I call them A and B. And then you end up with this kind of diffusion equation where uh, the, um, the function A is here, the function uh, h is here, and the function b, which seems not to be there, is actually hidden in the generalized uh, tortoise coordinate. So in the effective potential, of course, all the functions entering the metric are obviously present. So we have used a WKB uh, approximation uh, scheme because uh, it works quite well. We have two turning points, three regions, and everything is under control as uh, long as we don't go to too high overtone uh, numbers. And I'm just going now to review very briefly and very fast a few models. So for each model, I'm taking only one version. I'm aware, of course, that there are many refinements, but we have to, to go ahead, OK? So I just take the simpler or the historical version, if you want. Massive gravity um, was initially um, introduced as a, as a way to account for the acceleration expansion of the universe by generating a kind of Yukawa-like potential for gravitation. There were ghosts, but they were cured in the DRGT uh, setting. And of course, and, and also this theory has very interesting um, property from the holographic point of view and from quite a lot of other viewpoints. So in uh, the simplest setting, the, the metric uh, would, um, would take this shape, where the parameters uh, entering there are related to the graviton mass. And when increasing the graviton mass, this is the kind of pattern we obtain for quasi-normal modes. So the x-axis is the real part, so the frequency. The y-axis is the absolute value of the imaginary part, so the damping rate. Each family of curve corresponds to different L number, different multipolar number, L equal two, L equal three, L equal four. And when you go up, you just increase the overtone number. You increase the N value. Black is Schwarzschild. And uh, when you change the color, you just increase the graviton mass. So for example, in this case, what you see that increasing the um, graviton mass basically increases the frequency 
of the quasi-normal modes and slightly increases the damping rate. Um, in a modified S uh, scalar tensor vector gravity, you basically allow the gravitational constant, the vector field coupling, and the vector field mass to vary with space and time. We focus on a specific case where B uh, mu nu is nonlinear, and we choose the case where the W KB approximation holds, that is when there are two uh, horizon. In this case, you end up with a kind of renormalized gravitational constant and this kind of metric. And you see now that when you increase the deformation parameter, you still increase the value of the frequency, but you have basically no effect at all on the imaginary part, which means that you change the frequency, but you do not change the damping rate. Sorry, may I interrupt you? Uh, sure. what, what, what kind of solution of black hole do you use in massive gravity? Basically, yes, because uh, because one usual Schwarzschild is is a bit tricky in my so in, in this particular theory, in, in uh, GIGT, yeah, well, well, there is Schwarzschild, but it's 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 it's, it's, it's rather Schwarzschild. Ah, it's Schwarzschild Sitter, right? Okay, it's exactly. Schwarzschild Sitter, fine, exactly. fine, fine. Okay, okay, okay. okay. You are completely yeah. correct. Otherwise, we, we have yeah. trouble. I, yeah. I, I, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. In our Javali sheets, uh, people bet on the fundamental nature of the quantum theory, right? Instead of JR, it is a renormalizable UV complete gravitational theory, but it's not, it's not Lorentz invariant. The usual Lorentz time emerge only in the kind of large scale uh, limit. There are many kinds of black hole solutions. We focused on this most popular one. And here you see that when you increase the deformation um, parameters, beta here is the inverse of the parameters which, which enters the effective Lagrangian, you have a small effect on the, on, the, um, on the frequency. You have an effect, but a small one. But you have a big effect on the damping rate, especially for a higher overtones. I will only take five examples, don't worry. This is my, um, my fourth example. You can also consider the usual quantum corrections to the Newtonian gravitational potential that are obtained in effective quantum um, uh, gravity by imposing some consistency relations, uh, recovery of the black hole entropy and, and things like that. And you end up with this kind of uh, metrics. And in this case, you have as previously, no effect on the dumping rate, but you see that the frequency decreases and not and doesn't increase with respect to Schwarzschild. And to finish this very brief uh, overview, I considered um, polymeric black holes in loop quantum gravity, which is a kind of uh, tentative um, non perturbative quantization of JR, where black holes are described by the punctures of uh, isolated horizon with a spin network. And we used um, a, a mini superspace approximation with a minimum area gap and polymerization parameter. And in this case, you see that the behavior is non monotonic. So, first the frequency is increasing and then it is decreasing. And this is because there are now two fundamental parameters entering uh, the um, effective metric. So to summarize my point, I would say that clearly distinguishing at the experimental level with quasi-normal modes between those models would be very tricky. I, I, I'm completely um, aware of that because there are many degeneracies for given overtone and multiple numbers and between models when taking into account the fact that the parameters controlling the deformation as very are basically unknown. There are also um, the intrinsic characteristics of the black holes that are of course, a priori unknown, and this induces other degeneracies. And all that I've said now is for Schwarzschild black hole, but of course, this should also be generalized to care black hole, adding even more degeneracies. However, there are interesting trends, I think, that can be under, uh, underlined in the sense that for all models, the effect of modifying the gravitational theory are always more important, I mean, at the relative variation for the real part than for the imaginary part of the complex frequency. And we have never found two models with the same trains, which means that uh, each, whatever your favorite model, it's highly probable that it has signatures for quasi-normal modes that are very specific because QNMs are extremely sensi sensitive to um, the, the, the details of the, of the theory. So uh, I have to go ahead and I would like to finish with a, a, a toy model uh, that has been proposed by Rovelli and Hagar uh, two years back, I think, or something like that, uh, which is a model basically building on very simple and intuitive remarks uh, that are the following. 
uh, in, the, the typical uh, curvature lens, right, can be um, described by, uh, by, uh, by, by this, where R is the Kretschmann uh, scalar. And of course, if you try to estimate the quantumness of space-time by taking the ratio of the Planck lens to this curvature lens, it's completely negligible for astrophysical black hole at the horizon. The point from Ravelli is to say that, OK, but maybe this disregards the time-integrated quantumness of space-time. And for reasons that I don't have time to describe, he suggests to use instead this parameter as a measure of quantumness, where tau is a proper time, which is related in JR to the Schwarzschild time by this trivial uh, expression. And the interesting part is that now this Q function admits a maximum. And the maximum of Q, whatever T, is for R equal um, something slightly bigger than 2M. So it is slightly. Uh, beyond the horizon, it is in the, in the exterior of the black hole. So we, we, we have studied the quasi-normal mode with the deformation of the Schwarzschild metric with a naive Gaussian function that is situated at this position, and of course, whose amplitudes and width are, are, are set free because we, we don't have here a, a detailed theory. It's, it's, only, it's only a toy model. But it's interesting because the quantumness here appears outside the horizon. So of course, this is very exciting for phenomenology. Maybe it's a bit arbitrary, but at least it leads to something visible. So these are the associated uh, quasi-normal modes. Black is Schwarzschild and blue is for this toy model. And we have investigated how they vary for all the parameters. So for example, here we fixed the amplitude of the deformation and we let free the position and the width of the deformation. And this is a relative change in the real part of the quasi-normal modes. And it will not be for you a surprise to see that it is maximum at 3M. This is in mass unit, sorry. So this is the horizon in Schwarzschild, and this is 3M, and this is the maximum of the potential. So it's quite normal that this is the biggest effect. And the higher the width of the deformation, of course, the weaker the dependence over the position. We made the same for the imaginary part, and we made the same for positive and negative values of A. And I won't bother you with the technicalities, but we have all the uh, numerical values if you want to reuse this analysis for a different kind of uh, deformations. So it's, uh, it's, it's ready, and you will immediately have the, def the expected deformation for the quasi-normal frequency and dumping rates. So now you want to understand whether this is measurable. And I would say yes or no, because of course, the smaller the black hole, as usual, the more important the effect. I mean, as usual, as long as you deal, of course, with a, with a high field regime, you want the, the black hole to be small so that the gravitational field at the horizon is high. And we end up with the conclusion that in this model, uh, the quantum gravity effects may be observed for black holes that are lighter than 10 to the, mi oh, sorry, 10 to the minus 8 solar mass. So if you are an astrophysicist, this is very, very, very small. This is too small for being observed. But if you are a theoretical physicist, this is very big because this is much bigger than the Planck mass. So depending whether you are optimistic or pessimistic, you can consider this number as high or as small. The good news is that it is much higher than Planck mass. The bad news is that it is still too small to be uh, observed with, um, with stellar black hole. And we, we would need primordial black holes that are not yet uh, observed. So I'm running out of time, but we have also considered the uh, Hayward metric, which is quite interesting for its regularity and its capability to take into account uh, di time dilatation. And we, we set limits on the fundamental parameters so that the quasi-normal modes can be observed. Uh, we have also um, uh, revisited this uh, issue of uh, isospectrality that we uh, discussed uh, at the beginning. Uh, isospectrality, as, uh, as you uh, pointed out is uh, well understood for Schwarzschild black hole and Kerr black hole and Reichstein Orson black hole. Um, it's also well understood for de Sitter and anti de Sitter black hole. Uh, beyond this, uh, to me at least, uh, it remains a bit magic. Uh, some theories are isospectral, others are not. And I think this is something very um, exciting to, to study in more, in more details. So I think I should, uh, I should end now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this nice overview. And uh, may I also comment on this uh, isospectrality because um, it, it's not necessarily uh, always um, magic that it does not work because as soon as you have new degrees of freedom, 
uh, like when you include scalar fields or vector fields or something. Uh, then uh, in particular scalar fields, so there are so many cases where um, yeah, it's clear because you now have a, a new degree of freedom that mixes in the set of equations instead of a single equation, you obtain a system of equations. You, you have to break uh, this aspect reality since uh, let's say a scalar doesn't couple uh, to uh, the excel modes, but uh, it just contribute in the polar mode. So it, it's necessarily uh, a, a breaking of isospectrality that is involved. Um, yes, you're, you're right, yes, sure. But I, I, do, do you agree that there are some cases where it is obviously isospectral, some cases where it is obviously non-isospectral, but still in between, uh, at least to me, for some theories, it's not obvious to know from the beginning whether it will work or not. On this, I agree. So I think uh, I agree it's uh, a very interesting subject to, to work on. But in some cases, it, it's absolutely clear that it has to be uh, broken. So, um, yeah. Um, I see another question by uh, Michael Wondra. Thank you for, for the nice talk. Um, you have shown several models and, and showed that there are different characteristics of how the quasi-normal modes evolve. And all of these were in asymptotically flat space times, right? Um, yes. Do you also know what would happen in an ADS background, for example? Uh, do you think that also the models have peculiar uh, um, uh, evolution, if you want, uh, of the, the quasi-normal modes? Yeah, yeah, of course, the, the, this is a good point. Uh, AES is uh, conceptually very interesting. It is numerically not very uh, easy to deal with. So the honest answer is that I'm quite confident that the trends will remain, but it has not yet been rigorously done. So yes, I, I agree, this is something to, that should be looked into, into the details. And maybe there's some application within ADS CFT yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I see what you have in mind, of course. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, I uh, don't see any further questions. And thanks again, uh, Aurelia, for this nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, we continue with our third speaker. And now we go all the way to Australia. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Sebastian Moore. And uh, yes, he has already shared, very good. And he will tell us about constraining modified gravity theories with physical black holes. Please, Sebastian. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, so my name is Sebastian. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm a PhD student at Macquarie University in Sydney and also at the newly established uh, Sydney Quantum Academy. Um, before I get started, I would like to say a quick thank you to the organizers and session chairs uh, for putting together and managing the organization of this year's Master Grossman meeting and uh, moving things online. I know it's probably not the way most of us had hoped this would go, but it's still better than not having a meeting at all. At I believe so, thank you. And uh, as you can tell from the, the title of my talk, I will be discussing how we can use black holes as tools to constrain uh, modified theories of gravity. But before I get into that, I would like to briefly motivate um, why this is an interesting research area. Can you guys see my mouse as well, by the way? Moving on the screen? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, okay, that's see. great. It's good to know, awesome. Um, so general relativity um, is based on Einstein's fundamental insight that the geometry of space-time is the manifestation of the gravitational field. And uh, this is put in a mathematically precise form in what we now know as the Einstein field equations relating the geometry of space-time um, to a distribution of energy and matter. And of course, the reason we can treat energy and matter on the same footing is Einstein's other famous formula, uh, which tells us that they can be transformed into one another. Now it's important to point out here that uh, general relativity is an extremely well-confirmed theory. 
Uh, in fact, if you go online and you just search for observational tests of GR, you can probably spend at least half a day just reading uh, the Wikipedia article with various different types of tests that you can do. But despite that, uh, GR is actually um, consistent with all observations so far. We know that it is not a complete theory, it's an incomplete theory. And we know this because GR works with differentiable manifolds, but it predicts singularities, which are not differentiable. So GR is incomplete, even if we ignore quantum field theory. Uh, but of course, ultimately, there's also the question of how quantum effects can be incorporated into a fully developed theory uh, of quantum gravity and not just semi-classical gravity. So one of the most promising predictions of GR are black holes. And I say promising in the sense that uh, these strong field tests that you see listed on the right-hand side um, with scenarios involving black holes are in the regime where we expect that quantum effects of gravity uh, will become important. And so it seems very natural to turn to observations of black holes to guide theoretical developments in this direction. And of course, there are some famous examples, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Some five years ago, we have seen the detection of gravitational waves uh, announced by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. And uh, of course, many similar events have been detected since. In fact, there's a running tally on the LIGO website. So if you're interested, uh, you can always hook up the latest gravitational wave events. And I'm sure we all remember this photo here from about two years ago, published by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration which shows a light ring surrounding what is supposedly a black hole. And actually this study has since been superseded um, by their latest paper from October, 2020. And uh, what they've done here is they've used the observations to place very stringent constraints on how significant deviations from general relativity can be while still being compatible with the observational data. And you can do this because the size of this shadow region gives you an estimate or, or a bound, if you will, on how strong the gravitational interaction is. And of course, also last year's Nobel Prize uh, was awarded to um, black hole research, uh, namely to Roger Penrose for his theoretical work on black holes, most notably the singularity theorem, and to Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Guess uh, for the confirmation of the existence of a supermassive compact object in the center of a Milky Way. And as you can see animated on the right-hand side, this is just done by uh, monitoring the motion of stellar trajectories in the vicinity of the galactic center. Uh, it's important to point out here that, that the true physical nature of astrophysical black holes is still heavily debated. So it's not entirely clear what those objects are and what we're actually seeing uh, in the data. Now, what about black holes in modified gravity? And uh, the question we set out to answer here is, well, uh, what are the constraints that you can place on any self-consistent modified theory of gravity that must be satisfied to be compatible with the existence of physical black holes. And our only assumption here is that a regular apparent horizon forms in finite time of a distant observer, usually referred to as Bob. And I will motivate the reasons for this assumption on the next slide as well. And uh, it's also important to point out here, we are interested in matter solutions and so far only vacuum solutions are known, but we're really interested in solutions with matter here. Now the, I want to briefly discuss the, the formalism of our approach um, because in classical GR and related research areas, people often use the notion uh, of an event horizon, which is a global notion of the boundary of a black hole and therefore also observer independent. And uh, while this is very nice mathematically, it's important to understand that event horizons are not physically observable. And because of this event horizons are not very useful for uh, all practical purposes. But there are notions of black hole horizons that are useful, even for practical purposes. And uh, the most convenient one for what we want to do is the notion of an apparent horizon. And unlike an event horizon, this actually is a well-defined quasi-local observable, which means that at least in principle, you can make a measurement in a finite size region of space and within a finite time interval to determine whether or not an apparent horizon exists. And this is why we've used this as the starting point uh, of our work. And it's actually the only assumption that we make is that a regular apparent horizon forms in finite time of a distant observer. And uh, what we mean by regularity here is that the two curvature scalars that you can construct from the energy momentum tensor components are finite at the horizon. So they can have arbitrarily large values, but they cannot become infinite at the apparent horizon. And then what we're interested in is investigating what are the consequences um, of this formation of the apparent horizon for the geometry near the horizon, 
what are the consequences for black hole formation and evaporation and so on and so forth. And I've actually compiled a, a list um, with articles that summarize our results over the last three years. And um, the results I'm presenting today are mainly from uh, this latest archive paper here, where we specifically look at modified gravity theories. So let's have a look at our Einstein equations in modified gravity. So our goal was to keep things very generic and derive results that apply to all conceivable modified theories. And for this purpose, we can simply add a term to the Einstein equations that accounts for any deviations from GR. And this is the term that's denoted by uh, lambda e mu nu here. And we do not make any a priori assumptions about this modified gravity term um, to keep things general. And because of this, if we use this setup to derive constraints, without making any further assumptions, then the results that we derive in this way will apply to all possible modifications of general relativity. Um, and, and any modified theory of gravity must satisfy the constraints that we derive in this way, irrespective of uh, specific properties of a particular model. And uh, because of this generality, this is an extremely powerful approach. We also work in spherical symmetry. And before showing the Einstein equations of modified gravity in spherical symmetry, I want to uh, quickly illustrate the approach in semi-classical gravity uh, because the way you, you get those equations in uh, modified gravity is actually completely analogous. And uh, what I've written down here is just uh, an infinitesimal line element for a generic spherically symmetric metric. And um, this function f here is usually defined as one minus c over r, where c denotes the misner sharp mass. So this is a, a very convenient definition uh, of the mass that is invariant. So it will be the same across uh, different coordinate systems. And speaking of coordinate systems, the second metric function here, h, uh, is essentially an integrating factor uh, in coordinate transformations. For example, in the generic transformation between TR and VR coordinates that I've written down here. Now, what does spherical symmetry mean when we look back at our Einstein equations? Well, another way to specify the geometry is just by writing down the metric tensor. And we can easily do this if we're given the line element. And actually, because all the terms appear uh, in the squares of the coordinates, this is a diagonal metric. Now, the important thing to note here is that in spherical symmetry, uh, equations that contain angular components are not very interesting because they don't give us any useful information that we could use. So in spherical symmetry, it actually suffices to consider this TR block. And for the metric tensor, the TR and RT components are zero, but the same is not true for the Ricci tensor and the energy momentum tensor. However, we can use the symmetries of the Ricci tensor and the energy momentum tensor uh, to write the TR and the RT equation into a single equation. And so in spherical symmetry, we end up with three equations for the TT, the TR, and the RR components. And uh, this is them written down here uh, in the bottom left-hand side corner. Uh, you can express them, of course, as partial differential equations in the metric functions. And these tau functions that you see up here, here are essentially just the energy momentum tensor components uh, multiplied by factors of e to the power of h. And the only reason for using this definition is that it cancels some exponential functions. And so it makes the equations easier to deal with mathematically. There's no other reason for, for using this particular definition. Now, if you use the same approach in, uh, we can just use the same approach in modified gravity and we will end up with the same equations. And I've written them down here in this green box. Uh, but now we have to consider that our metric functions C and H are subject to perturbative corrections which we've called a uh, capital sigma and capital omega here. And uh, the same is true for the decomposition of the energy momentum tensor. And then what we can do is we can perform a series expansion uh, in the expansion parameter lambda. And schematically, this will result uh, in something like this if we only keep first order terms, where the terms that are labeled by the bar here um, are, are functions of the unperturbed solutions. And of course, you also get some tilde terms, uh, which are, are functions of the modified um, additional terms. And, um, oh yeah, this is just them. So what I've written here schematically, you can of course write explicitly, and then it looks like this, but it's really not uh, interesting to look at the precise form because it's not important for the rest of my talk. But of course you can write it down explicitly and then you will see that you have to splitting uh, between functions labeled by the bar and labeled by the tilde. Um, but the important thing to note here is that actually there is a way uh, to express the modified gravity terms as functions of the unperturbed solutions. And so what we, what we set out to do in, in this article is um, to obtain decompositions of these terms as a series in X, where X is the coordinate distance from the horizon, 
uh, defined by the aerial radius and the horizon radius. And then it turns out you can actually also obtain some relations between the coefficients of these terms. And now again, the important thing to stress here is because we have not made any assumptions, we have not specified the origin of the modified gravity terms, uh, the structural decompositions and the relations between the coefficients that you obtain in this way must be satisfied by any modified theory of gravity if that modified theory of gravity is to have uh, physical black holes. Otherwise, it cannot have solutions that correspond to physical black holes. Now, something that I have not yet mentioned, but needs to be mentioned before I show you our results is that uh, this is a known result from semi-classical gravity that there are only two distinct classes of solutions that correspond to physical black holes. And with respect to the regularity condition um, with the curvature scalars, uh, these two classes of solutions correspond to two values that this parameter k can take on. And uh, this parameter sets the scaling behavior of the energy momentum tensor components. And it turns out that the only two consistent solutions that do not run into contradictions are for the values k equal to zero and k equal to one. And so we often label the solutions um, as k zero and k one solutions. And as a side note, we, we have shown that these are actually, these two solutions are also the only possible perturbative solutions in uh, modified theories of gravity. And um, moving on to the results. So what we found for the K0 class of solutions um, is that the structural decomposition of these modified gravity terms is as follows. Um, you can see that there's half integer jumps uh, in this parameter X, which oh, I should have put this on the slide. Again, X is the, the coordinate distance from the horizon. And um, any theory of modified gravity that is to have physical black holes must have this precise expansion um, structure. So what this means is if you look at a specific theoretical model and you find maybe your TT equation has a divergent term that scales as one over X squared, then there's two things that can happen. Um, because the coefficient of that term has to be zero, so the term disappears. So either you will find that there are additional constraints that need to be satisfied by the theory to make this coefficient zero, or if you're really lucky, then maybe you might even find that it's not possible, and uh, this will tell you that it's not possible to have physical black holes in this particular theory. And then we have also found some additional relations between the coefficients. Um, the first one just relates, uh, so these are two relations between the lowest order coefficients, um, where this parameter psi is um, essentially just related to the evaporation rate. Without making any assumptions about the modified gravity term, it's not possible to give a, a physical interpretation of this term, um, but you can say that it, it's somehow related to the rate of evaporation um, of that dynamic black hole. So these are two relations between the lowest order coefficients. And then uh, in the K0 case, there's one more relation between the next highest order coefficients. And these also need to be satisfied identically and either you end up with additional constraints or the, the modified gravity theory cannot have physical black holes. Or I mean, there's also the possibility that it satisfies everything identically. Um, and then you don't get any additional information other than that this theory is a possible candidate theory, which is also nice to know. And essentially it works the same way for the K1 solution. Um, you can see that the structures are, are slightly different, but there's still half in digit jumps in this um, parameter X. And uh, also, the, uh, we only have two additional relations in this case. So there's one um, between the lowest order coefficients. And then there's another one, which actually involves a whole bunch of coefficients. So it's a bit more complicated. Um, but these also need to be satisfied identically um, in order for that theory to have black holes. And we have actually checked that um, these constraints are satisfied in the Sharabinsky model. So this is the simplest extension of general relativity where you also consider quadratic corrections in the Ricci scalar. So rather than just um, having uh, R, like in general relativity, you have R plus R squared. Um, and what we found is that in the Sharabinsky model, actually all the constraints are satisfied identically. So you don't get any additional constraints. The only information that you get is that this is a, a possible model that works. And um, of course, moving on from here, we want to look at other models. And uh, I'm actually already working uh, on Lovelock um, gravity models, for example. And uh, I've also managed to show you that actually any arbitrary F of R theory will add identically satisfy the constraints and not give uh, any additional information. And in particular, this is also true. I've seen some theories where uh, this exponent of the Ricci scalar can be negative as well, uh, but those will also identically satisfy the constraints. 
Now, since my time is um, pretty much over, I think I will stop here and leave you with the summary slide and open the virtual floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, yes, are there questions? So maybe I, I start with a question. Um, I, I was wondering, listening to you uh, about the possibility of uh, cases uh, which we know, uh, um, at least for other systems, uh, certainly, that uh, the modified gravity theory does not uh, have uh, the same set of uh, solutions as uh, um, general relativity. And uh, so that there's no overlap of these theories. So you cannot obtain uh, the solutions perturbatively from uh, general relativity solutions. Um, did you think uh, about that? Yes, that's why um, here, um, or where was it? Uh, we actually have, have shown that um, you can do what we have done in this paper, but um, it, it involves a lot of uh, detail that I didn't have time um, to get into. But um, yeah, so I mean, my, my short answer is uh, we have thought about it and uh, we're very confident that what we're doing, there's good reasons for, for doing it the way we're doing it, essentially, uh, with those two perturbative solutions. Um, because they're, they're very good arguments. Well, I mean, you can actually show uh, that anything else just fails. You, you must have the same two classes of solutions. Uh, there, there are, however, it's possible to have uh, non-perturbative solutions or solutions that are just expanded in this parameter lambda. Um, I think in the paper, we've called them lambda expanded solutions. Um, you can get solutions like that as well, but then they won't have a well-defined uh, GR limit. So yes, if that's a sacrifice that you're willing to make, then yes, you can also look at those models. Oh yeah, but it could be quite reasonable theories that might uh, have such solutions. They don't uh, have this uh, <clears throat> direct connection with GR solutions. And, uh, yeah, but, but ideally, I mean, if you let that lambda expansion parameter go to zero, you would somehow, I mean, you would want your well-defined theory to correspond to the GR solution. I think, otherwise it's a bit dubious what, what you're doing, I think. Or I, maybe I'm just understanding your question incorrectly. No, I think uh, you might still be able to satisfy all the constraints, let's say in the solar system or wherever, and uh, <clears throat> still um, you don't have this perturbative limit. Okay. So, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, are there further questions? I don't see any further questions than uh, Sebastian. Thanks again for this uh, very nice talk. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. <clears throat> and uh, we come now to uh, the next speaker. Um, this is Nuno Santos from Lisbon or Avero or both. And uh, we will now hear about black holes, stationary and magnetic fields. Please. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me and see my screen. Um, I'd like to thank the chairs for the introduction and also the organizers for this opportunity. So uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Nuno Santos. I am a PhD candidate working under the guidance of Professor Carlos Aguero at Instituto Superior Técnico and the University of Aveiro in Portugal. So today I'll speak about black holes, stationary clouds and magnetic fields. Um, I assume that everyone in the audience is familiar with black holes and magnetic fields in general. However, some of you may never have heard the term stationary clouds. So loosely speaking, these stationary clouds are um, bosonic field condensates in equilibrium with black holes, okay? So during the, the next minutes, I'll explain more precisely what they are and I'll put you in the picture of their connection with magnetic fields. And for that purpose, I'll start off by 
looking at some of the um, strongest magnetic fields in the universe. As you might know, some neutron stars known as magnetars are highly magnetized. Uh, this table uh, contains the surface dipolar magnetic field strength of most of the currently known magnetars and magnetar candidates. And as you can see, the, the strength of the magnetic field uh, ranges between 10 to the 12th and 10 to the 15th Gauss. Okay. Uh, so um, the space-time curvature uh, of a magnetic field of strength B um, is of the order of B squared. On the other hand, the curvature near a black hole of mass M is of the order of the inverse square of M. So these two contributions are only comparable uh, only if B is of the order of the inverse of M. And this relation sets a threshold value BC for B as a function of M. So let's assign some values to uh, the mass uh, M of the black hole. So for instance, um, the threshold value BC is about 10 to the 18th Gauss for a stellar mass black hole with uh, 10 solar masses, uh, and it's about 10 to the 10th Gauss for a supermassive black hole uh, with 10 to the 9th solar masses. Well, since the um, uh, strength of a magnetic dipole falls off as the cube of the distance from it, it's unlikely that these stellar mass black holes and even supermassive black holes um, are subject to um, such strong magnetic fields, okay? Anyway, our aim here is not to explore or study any particular uh, astrophysical scenario. So these estimates are only relevant here to define the uh, validity of our assumptions, of the assumptions we'll make later on, okay? Well, even if the strength of a magnetic dipole is smaller than this threshold value BC, um, its impact in a field interacting with a black hole may be relevant because the field can acquire an effective mass and be confined to the vicinity of the black hole. And if that, uh, that field is bosonic, sorry, okay, so uh, if the field is uh, bosonic, uh, it can induce superradiance, okay? So superradiance uh, is the extraction of energy and angular momentum from rotating black holes. And it takes place when the uh, frequency or phase angular velocity omega of the field satisfies this inequality where M is the azimuthal harmonic index and omega H is the black hole's angular velocity. Together with a confinement mechanism, uh, which can be naturally provided by a field with non-vanishing non mass, uh, superradiance can be responsible for bosonic fields to form uh, quasi-bound states, some of which can be uh, unstable and trigger a black hole bomb. Okay, but something special happens when uh, both the field and the black hole uh, synchronize. So when this inequality becomes an equality, okay? In that case, uh, bound states, true bound states can form. And these bound states were first found by Hod, who named them stationary clouds. So these stationary clouds uh, are real frequency uh, states uh, characterized by uh, this condition, which is the synchronization condition, okay? So much attention has been paid to these solutions since their discovery, yet most works rely on massive fields because, as I said, the mass uh, provides a natural confinement mechanism. However, a non-vanishing mass is not always mandatory. Uh, for example, um, as we will see, uh, a scalar field or a field, a bosonic field, interacting with a black hole immersed in a magnetic field is also likely to, uh, to form these bound states, these stationary clouds, because the magnetic field confines the environment. Okay. 
So um, perhaps the simplest example which naturally uh, embodies this idea is precisely the interaction of um, massless neutral scalar field with a uh, Reisner Nordstrom black hole immersed in a magnetic field. And the latter is described or can be described by the Reisner Nordstrom Melvin uh, black hole. Hereafter, I shall call it RNM black hole. Okay. So this RNM black hole is a solution of the Einstein Maxwell theory. And it asymptotically uh, resembles or looks like the um, Melvin's magnetic universe, which represents a, a bundle of uh, magnetic flux lines in equilibrium, uh, in gravitational uh, magnetostatic equilibrium, if you will. Um, so it is possible to embed any uh, or to immerse any uh, station, uh, asymptotic, uh, asymptotically flat stationary solution of this theory in a uniform magnetic field. Um, and this can be done through a solution generating technique uh, called Harrison transformation. And for instance, if you apply the Harrison transformation to the Heisner Nordstrom black hole, you will get the RMM black hole. Okay. So here's the metric and the electromagnetic four potential of this solution. So as you can see, the metric functions are rather complicated, but this solution is still exact. So here M and Q are the mass and the electric charge of the original black hole, if you will. B0 is the strength of the magnetic, magnetic field which is assumed to be much weaker than the threshold value. Um, and for those who are not familiar with these solutions, it might come as a surprise that this uh, space-time is station stationary rather than static. So if you look at the dragon potential, uh, you see that it is directly proportional to the product of Q and B0. Well, this is not surprising at all because, um, well, if a charged body rotates, uh, it creates, it induces a, a magnetic field and it can think the other way around. So if you immerse or embed a charged object in a magnetic field, it will rotate, it will spin. So, right. Um, so let me remind you that we are interested in finding the, the stationary clouds or the bound states between a uh, massless neutral scalar field and these RNM black holes. And to that end, we consider uh, the Einstein Maxwell theory minimally coupled to a massless engaged complex. Well, it could be real, but here uh, I consider complex scalar field. Uh, we must linearize the theory and then solve the corresponding Klein-Gordon equation for uh, the scalar field perturbation, delta psi, uh, psi is the scalar field, on the background of the RNM solution or black hole, okay? Uh, a tentative uh, approach to this problem is to consider a multiplicative um, separation of variables of this form where R and S are the radial and angular functions. So this ansatz, however, does not separate the Klein-Gordon uh, equation unless we uh, neglect uh, terms of order higher than um, B naught squared. In that case, in fact, the, the Klein-Gordon equation reduces to uh, two differential equations in R and theta the radial and the angular equations. They are coupled through uh, the Keeling eigenvalues, omega and uh, little m, little uh, big M, the mass of the black hole, Q, uh, B0, and the separation constant, lambda. So we can cast, uh, the, the radial equation can be cast in Schrodinger-like form uh, by introducing this new uh, radial function and also the tortoise coordinate and we get an effective potential and here's the uh, uh, limiting behavior of that, pot that potential 
So as you can see, it tends asymptotically to the square of the product of M and B naught, which suggests that the magnetic field provides the scalar field an effective mass, mu f, which is, uh, well, it's defined as the absolute value, if you will, of the product of M and B naught. So uh, let me now quickly explain the plot on the right. So here's the effective potential uh, as a function of the radial coordinate R for different uh, negative electric charges uh, per unit mass. Okay. So from this plot, it is clear that the magnetic field acts like, um, like a, po a potential barrier here. So uh, it resembles a mirror placed here. So it is natural to impose um, a Robin or a mixed uh, boundary condition, uh, a Dirichlet boundary condition, if you will, at some um, constant value R0 of the radial coordinate R, which is going to be of the order of the inverse of B0. Okay, so this would be, or this will be the outer boundary condition. Uh, on the other hand, the inner boundary condition, which is the boundary condition at the event horizon, uh, well, is a wave falling into the black hole if um, this inequality holds, or a wave emanating from the black hole if the super radiance condition is satisfied. And what happens when omega is equal to um, the product of M and omega H. Well, when this uh, holds, so when the synchronization condition holds, the radial function no longer behaves like a wave, and we get uh, the bound states, we get stationary clouds, okay? Um, by the way, if we consider uh, omega and B, uh, B naught to be positive, from this ex expression, we conclude that um, this product has to be negative. It's just a detail, okay? So we can find um, we can find these bound states by solving both the radial and angular equations, either numerically or analytic analytically. I'm not going to get into details here. I'll show you now uh, some uh, solutions, the solutions themselves. Um, so here's the parameter space, the two-dimensional parameter space of the RNM black holes. So these black holes exist below this line here, so in this region, okay? So they are defined by uh, the mass M and the electric charge Q, uh, and here they are normalized by the magnetic field strength. And these bound states, these stationary clouds, occur in one-dimensional subsets of this parameter space. They correspond to these lines. And these lines, which are known as existence lines, are disjoint. And they can be labeled by three quantum uh, numbers, uh, pretty much like an electron in a hydrogen atom. Okay, So these quantum numbers are the number of nodes in the radial direction and the orbital angular momentum, L, and the azimuth harmonic index, uh, M, okay? So this plot shows uh, some stationary clouds for um, uh, or with N equals zero, L and M equals one, satisfying in this case, uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition for different values of R naught, okay? So this is just an example. So to conclude, let me just run over the, the key points again. So uh, consider a massless engaged scalar field interacting with a heisenberg nordstrom black hole. Um, well, this system is not prone to super radiance. It would be if the, um, the field was charged though. And uh, it doesn't have any natural confinement mechanism. But if you consider the exact same system immersed in a magnetic field, the black hole will start spinning. It will acquire a nervous region and 
and it will become uh, prone to super radiance. On the other hand, the magnetic field provides itself uh, a natural confinement mechanism. So we could say that on the right, we don't have, sorry, on the left, we don't have stationary clouds and on the right, we do have, okay. And for most, if not all uh, stationary clouds studied in the literature, these two ingredients, uh, super radiance and confinement, are added uh, separately. Um, however, we show that um, this is not necessarily the case. So these two things, super radiance and confinement, uh, can have the same uh, origin, the same source. Okay. And I think that's it. Uh, so if you have any, any questions you'd like to ask, I'll be happy to answer them now if we have time. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. No, no, for this um, nice. Other questions? Um, <clears throat> when you uh, look at the, the clouds, you normally don't take the back reaction into account. Yes. Uh, is this true here also? So, uh, yes, uh, yes, this is true. Uh, now so start the, uh, for the full system. Yeah, so the clouds are, uh, are usually regarded as the linear realization of uh, hairy black holes. But here, uh, I'm not sure we can talk about hairy black holes because uh, we don't. We are not working with as, uh, an asymptotically flat black hole. So this space-time um, asymptotically approaches the Melvin's uh, magnetic universe. So it's a, it's a bit of, it's a little bit subtle here. That, that question, yes. Um, yes, yes, I fully agree. It's uh, much more subtle because of. Uh, uh, these very special um, boundary conditions that you have yeah. with Melvin. Yeah, it's um, pretty much like uh, ADS spacetime. So ADS is naturally confinement. Here, the the presence of the magnetic field will also con confine the environment, at least the the original um, environment. Yeah, it's an interesting observation. Um, uh, are there further questions? If not, uh, then let's thank uh, Sebastian once more. And uh, yeah, it was a very nice talk. Um, and now um, I suggest uh, we go to the next talk and I will switch with uh, Kamal. And Kamal is now handling uh, the session. Okay, thank you, Ruta, for for handling the previous sessions, and also I would uh, say congratulations and happy birthday actually to Ruta. Today it happens to be her birthday, so let's uh, say happy birthday and, <laughs> yeah, and go to the next uh, speaker, who is Michael Florian uh, Bondrak uh, from Goethe University, Frankfurt. And Ham Holtz Research Academy, SA for Pay. He's going to talk about uh, body and black hole from a self dual radius in a space time. Please, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, thanks very much for, for having the opportunity to give this talk here and for organizing this nice session. Um, I'm, I'm very happy and I, I would like to take this chance to congratulate Jutta uh, to her birthday. Very well. I have, one, I have one question. Do you see something over here? So I get warning that I should move something away or everything is fine? Okay, it seems to be fine. Uh, we can see that the box and uh, something inside that, but uh, yeah, it's happening. It's okay, okay. Uh, I have a second try. Okay, now it should be better. Uh, yes. Okay, very good. Very okay, good. so. Um, yeah, so my talk has to do something with um, self dual um, some self-dual radius and duality. So I first want to give you uh, an idea of what that means. So when you see both these pictures, uh, you see two animals. Well, and these are two kinds of cats. Um, but apparently they seem to be quite different one from the other. However, 
um, if you use the correct mirror, then you can actually identify the cat with the tiger. So there seems to be something that identifies two different systems. And actually, um, there is something called mirror symmetry in, in mathematics, which is related to t-duality in string theory. And it's not called just because there is a mirror in this picture, but because there is some uh, reflection symmetry. And we want to use um, this kind of duality to um, relate two seemingly different um, yeah, theories or objects. And uh, we want to do that in, in string theory. So we, we are looking for, for these two uh, sketches on the left and on the right. So we, we have non-compactified uh, dimensions, which, which are horizontal. And in this plot, we have one extra dimension which is compactified on a circle. And of course, these the circle can be of large or small radius, right? So a smaller R2, uh, R2 and a larger R1. However, it turns out, um, for example, in bosonic string theory, but also in the super string theories, that you receive, uh, that you describe the same physics uh, if R1 and R2 are related by a special um, relation namely if they are inversely proportional to each other. And there is uh, a unique scale involved, which is R star. And R star is then called the sale dual radius. So what does this mean? Well, this means that there is a minimal length um, that we have to talk about, because if I, I look for a situation where I make my compact X dimension smaller and smaller, actually I describe a system that is larger and larger. So um, we, we, we have a smallest uh, length scale from t-duality, which is given as uh, R star or in string theory terms as the square root of alpha prime, so of the string slope. So far, so good. Um, so now, look, uh, now let's have a look what we can do with that and what happens if this is realized in our universe. So we will have a look in for, for how to uh, derive the graviton propagator, then we will look for deriving a black hole solution, which we already know it's a Bardeen solution type, and study its thermodynamics. And then we look for some applications and uh, some ways to constrain this X dimension, this L0 that we have introduced. Okay, so starting from string theory, you normally have to do with these strings. So oh, if I switch back, the strings are like these uh, red lines that you see there, which are winding around the extra dimension. Um, and so we want to have a connection to our world, our three plus one dimensional world. And we can do uh, an approach. Let's say we take the string, but we are only interested in the center of mass of, of that object and say this center of mass represents our ordinary particles and also a graviton. All the dynamics that happens in the extra dimensions then goes into a modified dynamics of my point particle. So I have a, a three plus one dimensional point particle, which have modified dynamics inherited from that string theory and inheriting the knowledge of the extra dimension. And so if you look for, for the propagation kernel, which means that you go from one point to another point within some, some instance of time, and then you see that you have these orange and blue corrections to the standard formula. Well, okay, so you see this R, which is this um, radius of compactification. You also see excitation modes from string theory. And you see the kaluza klein and winding modes explicitly. However, what does this mean? If we now look for, for the effect on the Schwinger, uh, sorry, for the propagator, we can use the Schwinger representation, which simply means taking all these pro propagation kernels and weighting them um, with the, the propagation time. So this is what, what is the standard, standard way. But now if we introduce our corrected version, we can rewrite it. And we can rewrite it in such a way that we have the ordinary propagation kernel but with a different weighting factor. Weighting factor that is not only taking into account the, the propagation time, which is commonly denoted by S, but also the inverse of, of that propagation time. And if we, we have a look for how that looks like, 
Um, it's easiest to look for the Euclidean version where you have a minus in front. And you can have a look at this picture below. So this is the weight as plotted against this propagation time of my virtual fluctuation. Um, and ordinarily, you would have just the e to uh, minus ms. And so you would have such a decreasing exponential. However, uh, including the orange, so both of these effects, you find that there is a maximum and a minimum again. So what you find at this point is that there are some paths which are uh, the most important ones. So where, where you do not look for very fast propagation times, because that would mean you have very high energies and you would probe some quantum fluctuations of space time. But instead, there is some intermediate energy range in the time span for your fluctuations, um, which are associated with the biggest contribution for the final Feynman propagator. And now let's have a look of how that propagator looks like and look for void in momentum space and look only for, for the lowest excitation. Why do we look for the lowest excitation? Uh, because we know from, from string theory that we find the, the graviton mode as a, a low energy one and it is a massless contribution and we do not take into account the other states from, from the Kaluzak Klein tower that should be there or will be there. So what is the um, that contribution at, at, at the massless one that is for, for our graviton propagator? Well, uh, you find a modified Bessel function and you find some modification in the denominator. And there are now two regimes to be um, distinguished. And the first one is the low energy limit. So having small momenta with respect to our scale. Uh, and then you recover the ordinary Feynman propagator from uh, quantum field theory. However, if you go to large momenta, then you encounter an exponential suppression. So this propagator already tells us that if you go to high energies, and therefore to large curvatures or close to the singularity, so small length scales, there's an exponential suppression. And this exponential suppression uh, will help us getting uh, out of the ordinary singularity where, where we know that GR breaks, at least the GR is no longer predictable. So let's make a jump now. We, we know ordinarily if we have the standard propagator, we can derive the Newtonian potential for, for the gravitational interaction, and you can derive um, a black hole solution. We can also use that, that modified propagator and ask what is the black hole solution according to this. So if you would exchange gravitons between your um, masses. And if you do so, uh, you, you can derive the following metric. So it's the static and spherically symmetric one. And the, the only interesting um, entry is G not not, and you find that uh, as given over here. Okay. And so what you immediately realize when looking at this formula is if you cancel L not, then you reproduce the standard uh, Schwarzschild solution. Uh, however, having this L not, uh, it resembles the form uh, of the Bardeen black hole. So the Bardeen black hole solution was the first regular black hole solution proposed by Bardeen um, way back in 1968, where he introduced, the, introduced some parameter that, that acted as a cutoff, which is uh, not in our case. And this parameter was later identified to be, or can be a magnetic or an electric charge in nonlinear electrodynamics coupled to gravity. Um, however, in astrophysical situations, uh, it is difficult to, to, to have um, charges, even though they, they can be, and we have ni seen nice applications in the previous talk. Um, here, nevertheless, we have uh, a different kind of regulator, which directly um, comes from um, the gravitational theory at, at higher energies, from string theory inherited, if you want, so from, from L0. What is the structure or the implication of this metric? So here we have a plot of G not not as a function of the radial coordinate. And you see that there are three different curves. So the blue one, an orange, and a green one. And so we have three different regimes associated to three different mass regimes. If we have large masses, we have the uh, blue curve, which means that you have two zeros of G not not corresponding to two horizons, and you have an outer and an inner horizon. If you decrease the mass, then you 
find an extreme old solution. And if you furthermore decrease the mass, then you have some horizonless object, which can then be a, a matter accumulation, um, but without horizon. And all of these without singularity, because the ordinary um, Schwarzschild solution will show you G not not going to minus infinity. However, here we have a recovery and we have, um, uh, we approach one at the center, also with a slope of, or with a zero slope. So we have a regular space time and you can also prove that it is geodesically complete as to be expected, uh, expected from the Badin solution. Like that. So there's a repulsive visitor core um, and we have such a, a nice solution. What are the, the impacts on, on thermodynamics? Well, in you, you probably know the temperature, the Hawking temperature of a Schwarzschild solution increases as your, your black hole decreases. However, here we find a different, different behavior. So there is a maximum temperature and then afterwards um, the temperature cools down. You can think of that as such an evolution of a black hole to radiate, but stopping the accelerated evaporation and then entering a stable regime where while shrinking, the evaporation slows down. And so this can be seen as part of the heat capacity where you, uh, where you leave the instable region and then enter a stable region in a phase transition occurring at some critical horizon radius. So now it's interesting to, to have this um, um, solution of what is the meaning of this minimal length scale? Can we somehow relate it to um, our observations, right? And so there are two, uh, if you want, direct ways of testing this idea. Well, one from theoretical consistency, where you ask that whatever meta configuration you have, the associated quantum length scale should be included in the horizon. Otherwise, the idea of a horizon where nothing can come out um, would lose its, its real originality because if the quantum length scale is larger, you could tun tunnel out. So that's a theoretical requirement. And then there's also an experimental uh, requirement. So if you switch from, from the graviton uh, to the photon, it should show the same propagator. Then you can also ask what is the difference in the interaction between the proton and the electron, so the hydrogen atom, and what are the changes to the energy levels? Well, let's look for the theoretical consistency. So requiring that the smallest black hole solution that you have um, marks the transition between the particle and the black hole regime. So it's also a particle, uh, means that the extremal black hole radius equals its Compton wavelength. And from, from this condition, then you can derive a relation between the, the zero point length, which was unconstrained as to now, and the Planck length. And what you find is that the zero point length is of the order of the Planck length, well, which is to be expected if we take such a quantum modification into account. Well, okay, here's a nice spot. Maybe that is nice for, for, for getting the view. So this is the typical length scale associated to a mass. And the green dotted curve is the Compton wavelength, so associated to quantum physics, while we have the two horizons, the outer and the inner horizon at the blue and the orange one. And so at large masses, you have a black hole regime. At small masses, you have the quantum regime and you ask them to match exactly at, at the extremal configuration so that you have a clear transition from a particle to a um, black hole regime. There's a further interesting aspect. So where, where we could try to, to make sense from the gravitational perspective. So we know that L0 could be a, 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 around the Planck length, but there is also some experimental constraint associated. So there are tests of the inverse square law um, of the Newtonian potential, and they reach down to length scales of 44 microns. Now, if we assume that our, that our length scale um, could be affected, um, so it should be smaller than these 44 microns, otherwise it should have been seen. And if we fix L0 to be smaller than this scale, we also fix the extremal mass, so the smallest black hole mass that we have in, in this description. And so the smallest mass scale should be smaller than 10 to minus eight solar masses. 
And then we can ask ourselves, what are um, the implications maybe on the primordial production of black holes? And uh, so this is a, a recent plot by Carr and Kühnel. Um, and they show that, well, if you are uh, below 10 to minus 12 solar masses, it could, it could be that all the dark matter um, that we need in our universe to explain the cosmological evolution could be given as primordial black holes. So there could be a regime where these black hole remnants uh, make the, the dark matter in, in our spacetime. Nevertheless, um, we can also look for, for relation to some interpretation for our not from lab experiments. And so we return to, to the hydrogen atom and look for, for the energy levels. So we do some um, perturbation theory. Uh, I will directly go to, to the this constraint we get. So this is the transition frequency from the 1s to the 2s level, um, which is a metastable um, transition or metastable state, this 2s2 two, uh, state. Um, and therefore, it can be measured to high precision. Actually, it's the, the highest um, known frequency that we have in the spectrum. And it's almost comparable to the g minus 2 electron magnetic or uh, geomagnetic moment. So uh, uh, some quantity that is very high uh, measured and theoretically calculated in quantum electrodynamics. And so we can compare what happens. So the, the, the bounds from um, the experimental value or the distance between the experimental and the theoretical um, predictions on, on this frequency um, are, are given at, at below 10 to minus 13. And the contribution that we would add to, to this frequency by our t-duality concept is given as a blue curve. So the, the, um, the t-duality contribution has to be smaller than this constraint, which leads to a constraint directly on L0, which is of 10 to minus 18 or 10 to minus 19 meters. So well below 10 to minus 15 meters, which is the size of, of uh, protons. So we are where we at a small scale for, for our for lab purposes. And with this, I would like to, to conclude the talk to say that if we have such uh, T-duality realized, or at least it's kind of self-dual radius in our universe, um, we see that there's no singularity. We, re we receive the, the Badin solution, and we have a regular evaporation process to thermodynamically stable remnants, which then could take uh, the um, act as, as dark matter uh, uh, objects so, uh, as, as the reason why we have dark matter effects. And we can fix the scale. Theoretically, we expect it to be around the Planck length, this L0. And from, from lab experiments, we can go to below 10 to minus 18 meters. And uh, with this, I, I would like to thank you and ask you um, whether you have questions. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this nice talk. We have a very short time for very short uh, and fast questions. Is there any question or comment? Uh, please, Yuta. Yes, thank you very much. So was from my side, uh, Misael, uh, for this nice talk. Uh, when, when you consider this uh, dark matter, do you think, uh, and you uh, look for these constraints, do you then imagine that uh, these remnants would correspond to all the, or these, these black holes uh, of this type, these quantum black holes, quantum modified black holes, they would represent all of the, or basically all of the dark matter? At least that would be allowed. So the, the axis here is the fraction of primordial black holes, and it gives you the energy um, contribution or the energy fraction of primordial black holes to the total dark matter that is needed. And so um, in, in, their, um, in, in their recent overview, um, they, they found in this area no stringent um, constraint, so that really 100% uh, of dark matter could be, could be primordial black holes. But it could also be that you have, uh, of course, uh, combinations of, of different objects that are gravitating but only weakly interacting um, with um, whatever um, electromagnetism also that they are dark. 
Um, and and I, I have to, to, to remark that this is a revised version by, by K and Kuno. And there, of course, there are also constraints in this mass regime, but they are under special conditions. So they look, for example, at which redshift um, a, a constraint is valid or which it is not. So there are constraints, with, but these are not um, universally valid. Um, so in principle, there could be all dark matter as, as primordial black holes, but um, they are also just part of that. And, and then you have uh, less constraints. You could go higher up. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Is there any further question or comments? Okay, uh, I, I don't see any further question and comments. Let's thanks again, Michael, and uh, go uh, to the next talk with Surajit Kalita from Indian Institute of Science. Uh, he's going to talk about asymptotic flat black hole solutions in modified gravity. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so today <clears throat> I'll be talking about this topic and this work I have done with my PhD supervisor, Bani Brata, and it has been published a half, uh, a half year back in uh, this paper. So uh, <clears throat> let's go to the idea. Uh, so we know that Einstein's theory of general relativity is a very good theory to explain various astrophysical phenomena and early universe cosmology, such as uh, deflection of light in strong gravity, perihelion and precision mercury, and uh, formation of gravitational waves, and various other things. However, uh, <clears throat> even the past few speakers have also spoken that GR may not be adequate theory to explain the gravity at the high density regimes. And in those cases, uh, various people, various researchers propose the idea of modifications to this general theory of relativity. So uh, Starvinsky introduced the idea of F over gravity. And using this F over gravity, actually one can show that simultaneously explain the early universe inflation era and today's dark energy era uh, with this uh, F over gravity, that means it's uh, combining two eras. And also later various peoples uh, using this F over gravity models have been, uh, I mean, these models have been used <clears throat> to solve various problems related to the compact objects. For example, people have shown uh, in the case of neutron stars, if you use this FR gravity kind of models, uh, your maximum mass can increase. So if in some equation of state is giving say maximum mass is 1.8 solar mass, using this F FR gravity model, these things can go up to this two solar mass stuff, which we know that uh, the current theories. Similarly, we have also shown uh, using this FR gravity models, one can actually uh, probe this super Chandrasekhar white dwarfs. The, basically, some white dwarfs have been uh, indirectly predicted uh, from uh, observations of, uh, of a luminous type 1 supernova, which does violate the Chandrasekhar mass limit of 1.4 solar mass. And FR gravity is one of the fine theory to explain this observation, uh, this super Chandrasekhar white dwarfs uh, quite self consistently. But here, <clears throat> I'll be talking about the vacuum solution, basically the black hole solution. So I will not be using any of these things here. Rather, I will be talking about some, uh, I mean, matterless configuration, matterless structure as uh, space time. So I have used this kind of definitions. My G mu nu is the three, dim three plus one dimensional space time metric, and thereby I have uh, defined a fine connection. Riemann tensor, Ricci tensor, and Ricci scalar. So all these are quite standard. And uh, using all these definitions, one can usually write the Einstein-Hilbert action as like this, where this is the um, uh, geometry portion and this is the metal Lagrangian. And once we vary the, this Einstein-Hilbert action with appropriate boundary condition, we do obtain the Einstein equation. <clears throat> what happens in FR gravity, this R is replaced by some function of R, it's no, <clears throat> no longer just R, maybe it's a <coughs> R plus alpha R square or something like that. So if we just use this uh, um, F of R in place of R in this Hil uh, Einstein Hilbert action and use, we use um, varying this action like this, we obtain uh, the modified Einstein equation, which uh, gets like this. And if 
from here also we can see if f of r equal to r, then this equation reduces to this Einstein equation. And here I write capital F as equal to the far, uh, first derivative of this small f with respect to the Ricci scalar. So the, you can see in the right hand side, it's the, uh, still the same as the Einstein equation, which the, describes the matter Lagrange, matter Lagrange portion. However, since we want vacuum solution, the right hand side should be zero and this modified Einstein equation reduces to this one. And one can take the trace of this equation, which gives like this. And this trace equation is very important here because in modified gravities, there are actually something called fundamental degrees of freedom. In GR, there are only two fundamental degrees of freedom. However, in the um, uh, uh, FR gravity theory, there is additional degrees of freedom, which is the scalar degrees of freedom, which comes from this trace equation. So trace equation has to be considered always uh, whenever to get some dynamics or to idea of this space time in this uh, FR gravity system. So with this trace equation, now if we just substitute this f small f of r here, we obtain a different form of this modified Einstein equation, which looks like this. And if, if you can see, if I just take this z mu nu downside here, uh, the right hand side will be just a scalar. So we can always use say uh, zero zero element, which is zero 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 zero, and uh, this z zero zero comes down. And if we write the one one here also, these two terms has to be equal. Similarly, we can do for zero, zero and two, two and all other combinations possible. So with this idea, if we now use our vacuum solution, say we want vacuum solution and we want spherical symmetric solution, no charge, nothing like that, only simple uh, modifications to say short cell equation, we consider, we assume our uh, metric to be uh, of this form. And using this technique, we can obtain two equations which looks like this, where X is the multiplication between S and P, and capital F is the first derivative of this small f, and S is this one. So we have basically three unknowns, X, F, and S, but we have two equations. So we have to solve this, so due to, uh, and because we have one less equation, we, have, we assume small f, uh, sorry, capital F of R equal to some form of one plus B by R. How this form we have assumed, we know our f of r is r plus say alpha h of r, so that whenever we are coming to asymptotically flat limit, then alpha uh, this, uh, this term is uh, negligible and it reduces to only r. In that case, capital F of r is just one, which is also true in GR case. So we just want to have some modification of this capital F of r on the top of is this factor one. So we have assumed one plus B by R. One can in principle assume any form here and depending on this form, actually the ultimate form of S and P will be different. Now, if we use this form, let's see how the solution looks like. For capital F of R, once I substitute here, it's just only the matter of X equation. One can in principle solve, it's a first, the first order differential equation on X. So we ha I have one, a uh, constant of equations, say like C0, but we know as we go to asymptotically flat limit, S and P should be one like Minkowski. And because of that reason, X should be one. So substituting all these things, we obtain the constant of equations C0 to be 16. So my X I have obtained. Now I have capital F, capital X, I will substitute here. I can obtain the small s, and it's a double derivative in small s, I obtain two constant of equations, C1 and C2, and this is the solution. But since we require asymptotically flat solution, that means this term has to be zero because this is the diverging term. So uh, we put the coefficients of R squared to be equal to zero. And also we know that it's a modification to ZR. So at some limit, it should be uh, like a Schwarzschild solution. So the coefficient of one by R has to be equal to minus two so that it looks like Schwarzschild. So with these two conditions, we can obtain the uh, constant of equations, C1 and C2. And finally, my GTT, basically the temporal part of my metric looks like this. And these are the other uh, modifications. So up to this is the GR, and this is only the Minkowski portion. And similarly, once we obtain GTT, I have the expression of GRR. And with this, we can obtain GTT and GRR. So once I obtain, all of and other to the uh, angular portion is 
as the same as R square and R square sine square theta. So in that case, I have obtained a full metric. So I can obtain the Ricci scalar and Ricci scalar looks like this. And it seems, uh, seems that Ricci scalar is not identically zero at all the limit. So this clearly shows that it violates the Barkov's theorem, which is already known for some time <coughs> that in modified gravity theories, Barkov's theorem need not be uh, uh, validated. So once I obtain this R and small f of R, capital F of R, I can in principle write the final form of cap, uh, small f of R theory. And I am using this small f of R is the integration of the capital F of R with respect to Ricci scalar. And we know the form of Ricci scalar and substituting everything, we obtain the final form of uh, this. Uh, this is the final form where R is the GR, GR like term and these all are the modified terms. And this, uh, remember this form is only uh, valid or on very much dependent on our initial assumption. As I said, capital F of R is one plus B by R. One can in principle choose other modifications. Similarly, your this F of R will be modified. So I have now obtained the metric. The metric actually looks like this. The temporal part of the matrix is this. In GR, we know the event horizon comes at the two, so, uh, uh, two R is equal to two M. However, in, uh, mod, uh, in this modified gravity theories, this shifts. And also one important thing is that we want the gravity theory to be attractive. So R has to be greater than zero and to make R greater than zero, B, uh, B negative, negative values of B suffices this condition. So I am is using only the negative values of B here. Similarly, I can plot the GRR functions and it can be seen also from here and also the Ricci scalar. The Ricci scalar also can be seen that it also asymptotically goes to zero, where basically it looks like Minkowski or Sorcell at uh, large R. Uh, now I'm using this solution to, uh, to obtain basically the dynamics of the particle going around this, uh, going around the black hole. And we obtain this the V effect, basically the effective potential for marginally stable orbit also shifts and also the marginally bound orbit also shifts accordingly there with the increasing values of B. Now where, where we can use this solution, for one simple solution, we have used the spherical accretion. For example, consider a black hole and the matter is falling radially inward or it's going from the uh, black hole also radially outward. There is no angular momentum of the particles. In that case, we say these are spherical accretion. The Newtonian uh, version of the spherical accretion has been given by Bondi in 1950s. So it's just a modification to, uh, I mean, the scenario is the same here, but I am now going to use our metric that we have already shown here. And we solve this radial, uh, as, uh, basically velocity versus the radi uh, radial, uh, this differential equation. This basically gives us the idea of the particle going around the black hole. And one can see if uh, there are two branches always occurs in kind of this accretion. One is called accretion branch where the particle is uh, falling radially inward. And one is wind branch where the uh, particle is going out from the, uh, I'm outside from the black hole radially outward. And you can see once I take the uh, temperature of the disk, uh, say outside temperature here is 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Everything is matching with GR, only one portion, only one turn is, I mean, very, whenever it's coming very near to the black hole, it's uh, properties changes because here the event horizon also shifts as I showed in the earlier slide. So similarly, we can have different uh, um, out, uh, outside temperature and accordingly this uh, branches shift a, a little bit from GR. And these things can further be applied uh, to understand various other properties of accretion, this related to sequazimal oscillations and so on. But we still have not done that. So we have up to this. So in this conclusion, I can say that we have obtained the uh, asymptotically flat solution in flat vacuum solution in upper gravity. And we have shown that the Barkov's theorem is violated in modified gravity theories and also the event horizon shifts. Now, why I have shown the accretion this example, because earlier some fancy was done where people have done basically Ricci scalar to be non-zero throughout. That means it never approaches Minkowski 
once we go are very outside of the, very far from the black hole. And they usually call this kind of solution as the dark energy solution. But we know accretion, in accretion, this dark energy is not that important. So uh, rather than using those uh, diverging solution, to, it's better to have an asymptotically flat vacuum solution. And we have shown that the, our metric is um, asymptotically flat. And uh, of course, as I have shown, GR is almost sufficient unless we are going very near to the black hole. And of course, a better explanation in future for real estate acquisition, this containing angular momentum can be carried out. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Suraji, for this uh, talk, this nice talk. Uh, is there any questions and comments? We have a few minutes. Uh, please, Yuta, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, nice talk. Um, since you're looking at accretion, this means to me you're interested in the astrophysics uh, scenario. And, yes. Uh, I've been wondering, uh, in astrophysics, everything is rotating. So just yes. uh, one would like to uh, include rotation. Did you think of uh, looking at this maybe at least perturbatively? Uh, actually, yeah, we trace with, if we want to use rotation, we have, will have the G phi t kind of element where the moment uh, rotate, uh, phi means the angular momentum and the t is the temporal part. Those terms will be non-zero like the car metric have. So those terms needs to be included in that case. But here, our assumption is like that. If you know, uh, say accretion this, there, is, there are some modules in accretion this, but mostly people use called Keplerian and subcaplerian this. Keplerian this is very far from the black hole, whereas subcaplerian this are near to the black hole. In Keplerian this, there is very little radial, uh, radial uh, velocity. So particles are moving just round and round. Whereas in subcaplerian, it's going around, but also it's falling radially fast and fast. So our assumption is that when it reaches the black hole, this uh, angular velocity is very much, uh, very much small compared to this radial velocity. In that case, it reduces to this bondy like flow or spherical accretion flow. So we use this kind of approach here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and is there further questions or comments? Okay, if no, we can uh, thank again uh, uh, Surajit and uh, move to the yeah. next speaker. Thanks. So Thanks. is Semin Javier from Institute, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. He is going to talk about uh, infinitely de degenerate exact rigid flat solutions in f of r gravity. Please go ahead. Hi, first of all, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, uh, very okay, good. Okay, I'll start. And uh, first of all, I'll thank you, the coordinates, for giving me a chance in this uh, meeting. And this is the work that I have done with Jose Matthew and Shankar Narayanan on infinitely degenerate eccentric key flat solution in FFR gravity. As we know that Einstein's gravity is one of the successful theory. Uh, but there are numerous modifications suggested for Einstein's gravity, in which uh, FFR theory is one of them. And uh, in the case of FFR gravity, the modified Einstein-Hilbert action is represented by in the equation number one. The most general form of FFR is given by equation number two. And uh, the one of the feature of FFR gravity is uh, it contains the basic characteristics of higher order gravity, uh, which we can see from equation number two. The terms in the red color in the expression in equation number two mainly contributes to the higher energy correction for the gravity. And while the terms in the blue color mainly contributes to weak energy corrections. And the field equations and is well explained by Surajit. I don't think so. It's much more needed from my part. And in the case of Einstein's gravity, we know that there is two important works. One is the Birkhoff theorem. Another one is the Nohair theorem. And Birkhoff theorem is saying that Schwarzschild solution is the vacuum spherically symmetric solution for the Einstein's gravity. 
while no hair theorem says that uh, black holes from einstein's gravity is characterized by a certain number of fixed parameter in our work we would like to check the validity of birkhoff theorem as well as no hair theorem in the case of modified theories of gravity for which we have considered ffr theories as a model toy model for that part and we considered that ffr of the form in equation number 3 and uh, from that equation number 3 which we can be simplified into a binomial form in equation number 4 where we considered alpha not and alpha 1 as greater than 0 and p is greater than 1 but there is no restriction that p has to be integer it can be any fraction also and the consideration p greater than 1 necessarily makes that we are considering only modification to the einstein's gravity and from the simplest case as so all of know that if we consider p is equal to 1 that f of r will be alpha not plus alpha 1 r where alpha not behave like a cosmological constant and alpha 1 uh, modifies the newtonian constants and in our work we would like to obtain spherically symmetric solution for our ffr model for which we have considered the metric of the form in equation number 5 where alpha uh, where i of r and delta of r are the metric variables as uh, previous talk said that compared to einstein's field equations that uh, in the case of ffr gravity the field equations will be higher order and it will be we know that it will be much more non linear differential equations and these non linear differential equation we were i am representing in equation number 6 and more specifically i can say that that is 6a and 6c are fourth order differential equation in terms of metric variables while 6b is a third order differential equation in terms of metric variable so the uh, one of the result one of the main result of our work is that even though these are the higher or higher non linear differential highly non linear non linear differential equation we were able to represent them into a simple set of uh, differential second order differential equation and uh, before i am going to showing that uh, result uh, that is a rep that is a sim uh, that uh, resultant equation i would like to show the procedure we used for uh, obtaining that result by that equation and by that means that uh, we obtained a unique equation or uh, we met the obtained equation is a unique one for that purpose we have adopted the method is first way, first method is as i told that that 6a and 6c is a fourth order differential equation in terms of metric variable so first we eliminate a of r using 6a and 6c which will result into a third order differential equation this resultant equation can and 6b can be used to eliminate the third order which will result into that our final equations so if we use the same procedure for another uh, metric variable that is delta of r that is uh, use the 6a as well as 6c for eliminating fourth order terms in the uh, for the delta of r and the resultant equation can be used to the elimination of third order terms in 6b which will leads to the similar like equation as we obtained in the previous case that means the obtained the equation is unique that equation the resultant equation can be represented in equation number 7 that means for our ffr model we have two branch solution either it has to satisfy t1 is equal to 0 or t2 is equal to 0 most importantly for given a of r we will get two delta of r either it has to satisfy t1 is equal to 0 or t2 is equal to 0 and uh, from equation number 7 we can see that for a non trivial cases we are considering p is not equal to 0 and p is not equal to half and p is not equal to 1 which is uh, p is equal to not equal to 1 that i explained in the first slide itself and uh, there is and from equation number 7 that the non divergence of the equation 7 will give a functional relation between 
a of r and delta of r which is represented in equation number 9 that is a mu of r which is arbitrary with the rest certain restrict two restriction that is in equation number i have represented that means if we were able to obtain a, a of r and delta of r with the a of r with the condition of mu of r they are arbitrary we have a arbitrary choices if they satisfies either of t1 is equal to 0 or t2 is equal to 0 means we have a infinite number of solution for the given metric in the f of r in our f of r model so in our work we are mainly focused on the black hole solutions using the previous method that i have described we were able to obtain two black hole solution one is the case uh, delta is equal to 0 the t2 is equal, t2 equal to z vanishing of t2 equal to 0 will give that uh, metric a of r of the form in equation number 10 and if we consider delta is not is equal to 0 as well as a is of the form in equation number 10 we will get a equation a equation for delta of r which result into the form of a delta of r in equation number 12 so uh, and the interesting properties of these black hole solutions are we found as these two black holes which i represented in equation number 12 and equation number 11 the have same point of event horizon but their asymptotic properties are different and uh, their event horizon is represented by in equation number 13 and from uh, the alpha not tends to 0 the horizon tends to square root of c3 which is a smooth limit and uh, the uh, main result uh, that is one of the pointing result that we obtained is that our black hole solution has 1 by r square term in the absence of 1 by r term which is much different from einstein's gravity and if we evaluate the scalar invariant quantities they are only singular at r is equal to 0 while if they are finite at everywhere and the surface gravity are found to be 0 and uh, from the krushman scalar at asymptotic infinity it's found to be positive and it suggests that the its asymptotic visitor space for, for these two black holes and from these results we can conclude our work is that these two black hole solutions are among infinite number of ricky flat spherically symmetric vacuum solution for our ffr model and uh, from the field equations we can see that the field equations are a higher fourth order differential equation that means we should have at maximum of four arbitrary constants which is uh, c2 c3 c4 which is used in the for finding the black hole solutions and uh, for obtaining the regular solution we should have a, bound, a boundary condition imposed on finite r which is related uh, to the arbitrary function mu of r and uh, basically the main result that is we were able to show that the birkhoff theorem is not valid in the case of modified theories of gravity as there is there is a lot of work which is shown that uh, it's not valid but they were able to show at least one or two results only but in the case of our one we clearly showed that they can there is an infinite choice of result is existing for our uh, ffr model that means it's clearly shows that birkhoff theorem is not at all valid and these are uh, the of my our main works and uh, thank you for all hello okay thank you uh, sam for the uh, clear talk now is like is there any questions or comments okay I have a question actually about uh, this uh, transformation. We can transform f of our gravities to have Einstein gravity plus a scalar with some potential. If we go to this picture, uh, uh, 
Is, isn't it clear that we uh, have yeah, have or it. have not big of theorem and also this no no hair theorem? I got it. actually you are asking about the conformal transformation to the Einstein's frame. That's what no. Exactly. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a so, there is a actually there is a Legendre Legendre transformation first, and then you uh, yeah. use that to go from Jordan frame to the Einstein frame, and then a potential appears for the. Yeah, for the yes, scale. Uh, the thing is, uh, but in the case of uh, our FFR model, all I'll just show you that. Uh, uh, I'll show you that thing. Um, in the case of our FFR model, the equation number four, all the Ricci 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 scalar found to be a constant, and our solution makes that FFR is a vanishing one. Hello. Okay, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and the problem is uh, for existing of conformal transformation that uh, at least uh, the first derivative of uh, FFR with respect to Ricci should be a positive. Uh, you got? Actually, the first the first derivative of f of r with respect to the r is that is, is that a, that a scalar field that we have in the dual picture and that scalar field uh, can have any value i don't see why it should be positive because that's uh, that's the scalar field in our new picture and the scalar field in the new picture uh, the dynamics define how that it would behave so this if you you have mentioned you noted it with a capital f and that capital f of r is the new scalar that we are in hand so why yes, should be but, positive? Uh, but in the case of our solution, this f of r will be a vanishing one, and uh, we are considering it will be our uh, our Ricci scalar will be like uh, minus of alpha naught by alpha one. So and uh, that's a polynomial we are considering p is greater than one now. So all the differentials of a Ricci uh, that is f of r with respect to Ricci will be a vanishing. You got. Mm. This is your. This is your. You assume this. You assume that all of. Uh, oh no! In this, uh, all the solutions. That is for uh, this. Uh, in our case, we mainly used uh, this equation. That is uh, t two is equal to zero case. T two. That is our metric is uh, t two is black hole solutions are t two is equal to zero for which. That one is a f of r is a vanishing, but there is a choice which we can say either t one is equal to zero. Hello, you, go, you, okay. you can say yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But that one is a highly nonlinear, which we are trying to obtain some other method to find the solution, which we are we are we are much more sure there where that f of r won't be vanishing. So it will give a fruitful result, but we are trying you now. That's what our work actually after letter this part. So we are okay. using some other method to obtaining that one. But all this because in this one we shown that T two will be a zero solutions will be giving a Ricci flat solution which will vanishing that is vanishing f of r, which for which there won't be any transformation we can expect. That's the problem. Okay, thank you. We have uh, two minutes left for the next to the next speaker. So, if there is any question or comments yet, yes, I will. Um, maybe I I could ask uh, something. Maybe when you have uh, several solutions, uh, do you then go to some physical constraints? Uh, I don't know solar system uh, or what we know about uh, black holes to say um, this one solution is probably unphysical and this solution could be possibly physical. Yes, uh, but I the, uh, the, the you are saying that uh, tenth one that is equation number ten won't be unphysical. You are saying like hello. Hello. Yes. Can you hear? We are saying yes, yes, yes. which one? That is equation number ten. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the thing is uh, we can uh, we are uh, we claim that it is like but it's a charge like one in the sense uh, we don't because we are uh, we don't know actually we are just claiming it will be like a uh, it can be ma it's mass actually otherwise it won't work but combined to the Reisner Nordstrom it is much different that's in the that's what we showed actually it's a much different from einstein's gravity but physical existence is still a question mm, yeah <clears throat> but, but you also had uh, other cases with the uh, several branches didn't you so yes uh, yeah that means yeah that's what this uh, t2 vanishing one is uh, no, it's it's uh, it's a question but T1 is vanishing one is a, it's a good choice actually, which we are working. It will lead to a, maybe it will say physically observable so much if we expect, we are working actually. We, we are working on that one so that we don't know. I don't know actually. So how the solutions will behave. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, is there further question or comments? Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions. So let's thank Jane Semin for this talk. And we can move to the next speaker. Uh, uh, we are waiting for uh, him to join us actually, but let's uh, introduce him first. He, uh, the next speaker is Andrew Beckwith from uh, Chongqing University, China. The title of the talk is Does the Penrose Suggestion as to Black Holes from a Perrier Universe Showing Up in Today's Universe Have Credibility Examined from a Singular and Non-Singular Beginning of Cosmological Expansion? So let's see if we can have uh, our speaker who is actually right now has another uh, talk uh, in, in another session, but uh, he's going to join us at 12. And let's see if he can or not. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, he promised to, to be here at 12 o'clock. But of course, one never knows how another session is going, uh, whether they yeah. are time. Um, yeah. So exactly. we don't know. Uh, we have a bit of time. So maybe um, if there are new questions to previous uh, speakers um, who are still around, we could also discuss uh, on on those uh, mm -hmm. already actually i have a question from michael mm -hmm. yes uh, it's about that uh, t duality for bosonic string theory i don't know how how much this bosonic part of the bosonic string theory is important in that in that analysis uh, for example for the supersymmetric string theory with fermionic strings I don't know how much this bosonic part and the dimension of this system is important in that analysis. Um, a good question. Um, it is not important. Uh, we, we have chosen it for, for simplicity in order to, to write down the propagator in a, in a, in a concise way. Um, but the, the main feature is that you, you have this the x dimension and the special relation among the, the radii. So it should also work out um, for, for the fermionic one. Yes, indeed. Um, so the version, the propagator that I've shown you or that propagation kernel was for an arbitrary number of dimensions D, spatial dimensions plus one compactified dimension. Um, what we really did is to, to compactify, well, uh, 21 uh, spatial dimensions so that you, you have the ordinary 26 dimensional uh, bosonic string theory case. Um, but, but the structure is more or less the same. We, we have chosen a toroidal configuration where all the extra dimensions are compactified to the same size. Um, and the, the difference would just be that you have a different D. Mm. Um, it, what, what, it, what comes in is that you, you have the critical number of dimensions, then you have these um, 
masterless graviton degree of freedom. Um, but then, yeah, well, the formula is then simply adapted to, to the supersymmetric case where there's a different critical dimension and then the graviton should also be masterless. So yeah, it should be, should work out also for the fermionic one. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Very nice. Further questions about the previous talks? Hmm. Do you think you thought that we can wait more for Andrew or? You are mute. You don't. Yes, I, uh, I, I noticed. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> he, he might try to check into our session. Um, but, uh, it's not clear when. Uh, let me check whether he sent an email. No, I, I don't uh, have no, anything, I any news from him. Um, so uh, it, it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it, if it helps, I know that he's having several talks in succession and he started the first one 10 minutes late, so that might help. So you were also in this uh, session? Oh, no, I, yeah, oh, he's no, coming. He's okay, so we have yeah, already. Right here. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay, we have already introduced you, so you can just uh, go ahead. I'm and, right here. I just, yeah, simply just finally showed up, but which was, was that uh, experimental gravity was late, and I, I got off after eight minutes, and okay. I was trying to shut them off, and they actually dragged me out. I'll try to see if I can say something. Okay, uh, so please share your screen and go ahead because we are out of time. I think. So I don't have a chance to speak. You have. Please share your screen. What? Please share your screen and uh, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. It's not you. It just is that I'm frustrated to death with uh, I'm frustrated to death with experimental gravity. Frustrated. Uh, let me just get my thing off right over here. Oh, damn. It made it everything very, 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 very difficult. Wait a minute. Oh, damn it. Go away. Go away. They just drove me crazy. Go away. Okay, go away. Thank you. Penrose, thank you. Anyway, which is is that this is me. And I'm showing the screen. Do you see the screen? You see the uh, screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 You do. Thank God. Thank God. They really think they're forget it. I don't want to go into I don't want to get settled off. Penrose suggestion as the pre-Planck era black holes showing up in the present universe data sets discussed with a possible candidate the gravitational wave radiation, which may provide initial CMBR data. <clears throat> what we are doing is threefold. First, we examine the gist of the Penrose suggestion signals for a prior universe showing up in the CMBR. Secondly, we give a suggestion of how supermassive black holes could be broken up to a prior universe for pre planck condition, which say millions of pre planck black holes show up a break a breakup from the prior universe black holes. Then we have a discussion of Bose-Einstein condensates. The BEC uh, formation gives a number of gravitons linked to entropy for black hole, which could lead to contribution to the alleged CMBR perturbations, which were identified by Penrose et al. Keywords. Okay, first was the Penrose suggestion. <clears throat> uh, 
The idea was, yeah, the significance of individual low variance circles and a true data set has been disputed later. Independent analysis that confirmed CCC activities, CMB, uh, says a cosmic microwave uh, background circles have a non Gaussian temperature distribution. And that's what their idea was. There's the initial inflation or expansion universe that Kabit is that matter energy is sucked up in supermassive black holes. And uh, so then here is what the idea is. <clears throat> Consider a suggestion of black holes being the template for a story of the present universe. And uh, the CMBR spectrum is a real data, but the words of getting the information would be was said as the ghost of a prior universe black hole radiation. So this is the diagram. This is the diagram that what was done by a figure, what are, what are, what a figure which has competing black hole radiation, what can be seen is CMBR. A conformal diagram representing the effects of a highly energetic event occurring at the space time point H. And CCC H is taken to be a Hawking point virtually the entire Hawking radiation of previous AEN supermassive black holes concentrated H by the formal compression of the, uh, of the holes radiating future. This is the exact quote. <clears throat> At the line at the bottom stands for the crossover surface dividing the previous cosmic AEN from our own that describes our conformally stretched Big Bang. In conventional space, in conventional inflationary cosmology, H would represent the graceful exit turn of inflation. Okay. So this is what was uh, really what was referring to. They're talking about something like a supermassive black holes, and you would see something that would show up in the CMBR. <clears throat> what can be expected from this transition for a prior university to Planckian regime of micro black holes? Well, what I here is just an idea of what you might call just for a uh, black hole, black hole uh, binary change your energy, this is very standard. For M about the size of a black hole, it seems that likely this would fade out very quickly. <clears throat> so then what I said is that you'd have supermassive black holes that'd be broken up into millions of very small black holes at, you know, from the prior universe being cycled through 10 rows to something which you might call an in spiral collapse and then, which is, you would have something pushed through a near singular point. So you would have what is known as, this is known as um, the mass NP, the number of gravitons, M, the mass of black hole, NP, black holes. Here's the entropy, and here's the temperature. And this is what you would get, they say, from a supermassive black hole. This is the big one. And this is something that might be spiraling in, right in. <clears throat> then, which is, is this is the Bose-Einstein condensate argument, which I took from the, uh, I took in the, uh, in one of the references. And I gave an argument is that, um, what I gave an argument is, is to this. End of the prior universe frame, uh, universe time frame, mass black hole, supermassive end of uh, time black hole, uh, let's say roughly to 10 to the 41 to 10 to the 44 grams, number of black holes, 10 to 6 to 10 to the 9th of them, usually from the center of galaxies. <clears throat> this is what you get, the end of the prior universe. This is the Planck area black hole uh, formation. It's during this uh, form of black holes. You have mass of a black hole, 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 4, the number of the black holes, quite a few of them. Post-Planck black holes, you'd have a contribution. Now, what you would have in the situation, which I was trying to refer to, this is known as the BEC, Bose-Einstein condensation about treatment of mass. This is, uh, this is the mass of, say, of, a, of a radiated particle from a black hole. This is Planck's mass, this would be a number of gravitons. This is if you'd had plank sized black holes were essentially a BEC graviton condensate. And this is uh, adequately sourced in the references. And then this is a suggestion which I made as these were traveling rapidly, how you could have to say something like 10 to the 10 
in terms of the number of gravitons attached to a small mass and to a small mass, whatever this is, this is where you have 10 to the 10 of these. And here's the small mass, and here's the number of the gravitons, and here's the mass of the graviton in Planck. And you would get this shortly after a recycling a Penrose CCC cosmology. And scaling of black holes is a cosmology assumed for the radiation release may affect the CMBR. So that's was my point right over here. Why we want to have the figures from uh, 3B to consider for contributions to the Penrose suggestion. Well, the reason why I was referring to was this. Our final point in concluding this chapter is to review the physics of figure one and ask if we can ascertain the gravitational wave radiation of Planck era black holes in a binary configuration uh, contributing to the buildup of, uh, of getting frequency. And so this is what my guess was. And this is referring to, you've had very big black holes that get broken up. Here is the Bose-Einstein condensation treatment of a black hole is commensurate, they say, with something to do with uh, gravitons or some sort of, you know, uh, and the idea for this was the reason why I even referred to this breakup of very large black holes in some of the Bose-Einstein condensation let me just show you this right over down here so that uh, uh, this is example at uh, Penrose's uh, suggestion right over here. Here's what Penrose actually uh, suggested right over here. I've had this. This is what you're saying. These contributions would in the end, which you might call contribute to what uh, Penrose has referred to the bubble nucleation plus detail of the cosmology. And uh, this is the most monthly gnosis of the Royal Astronomy uh, Society. And here you would have uh, the early universe expanding, should have obliterated such features. Well, you'd have features right over here, which is what you might call small, small circles and other things in the CMBR, which you would expect would have been obliterated. And what I'm saying is, is that you get something from the CMBR, other things to sort, because you have a downsizing of supermassive black holes to bro be broken up into Planck sized black holes, which would be Bose Einstein condensates, which is by this rule right over in here. Where did that rule come up from? I'm going to show you right over here. Uh, where did that rule come up from? I'll show you right over here. Here's, here's uh, the bibliography. Gurizan Penrose, our CCC uh, 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 concentric low variation circle, the CMB, our uh, CMB sky. And here's black hole genesis. And uh, while what was I citing in terms of this? Here's, here it is. P.H. China, the self-gravitating Bose-Einstein condensates a quantum aspect of black hole. And this is editor of Fundamental Theory of Physics uh, 178, right over in here. So what I was doing, what I was saying, was that you would had many black holes. And you could see this say, this also it might explain this data, which was brought up by, uh, this was brought up by, uh, in by Abe Abishenko. And I think it also is, he had his loop quantum gravity and the bounce right over here with respect to this data, right over here explaining this type of behavior. I'm also arguing too though, is that if you had many small, if you had many small, what you might call, this is the Bose-Einstein uh, condensate treatment of micro or mini black holes that this itself would be a contributing factor as to, you would be a contributing factor to what is being seen in this diagram right here. All right. And this is the diagram that was cited by Penrudge. All right. 
And he said, recent analysis of the cosmic microwave background by Roger, uh, Roger, Daniel, and, and Poway had revealed that uh, a powerful signal has never been noticed uh, before previously, na namely numerous circular spots, eight to eight times the diameter of the full moon. The brightest six are 30 to 30 times the average CMB variations of precisely the same locations in the Planck and W map data. These spots <clears throat> were overlooked previously due to the belief that the early universe exp uh, exponential expanding inflationary phase would eliminate such features. And this is right over in here. This is right over here. And so you would have something which you would not see. And that what I am saying is that judicious application of equation two, the micro black holes, which you would get, which would be Bose-Einstein condensates, would be coming from supermassive black holes being essentially ground apart and torn apart at the end of the so-called cyclic, uh, the CCC cosmological cycle. Now, this is my talk. I, I don't have very much time but I've said basically what I had to say. There's a lot more detail to it than that is I do have, I do have some fairly detailed calculations as far as uh, equation two and its connection as to how this might influence what you might call this, this right over in here. So that is my talk. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, is there any question or comments? I'm appealing, let me just say this, I am appealing to what was brought up in equation two as a breakup of millions of these small primordial black holes. I'm appealing to this. And the CNBR and the CMBR, uh, which you might call circular holes or something like that, is an interrelated phenomenon. You've had millions of these very small black holes that would be broke with a byproduct of very large black holes being broken up and being focused in, and that you would see the results of Bose Einstein condensates would have a very significant role as to why you'd be able to see this type of a diagram. That okay. is my suggestion. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> and let's uh, hear the last words from Utah and close the session. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I would also uh, like to thank once more all of the speakers of today. We had a very interesting uh, session with uh, lots of interesting talks. And uh, yes, we are looking forward to the next session of our Black House and Alternative Theories. I appreciate of it too. Uh, Gajada, I just want to say I appreciate it too. I appreciate that both of you made time because that I've been fighting for over four days with, uh, I've been fighting with over four days with uh, the people in experimental gravity and they weren't so helpful. Um, yeah, but uh, we managed now, and so uh, all is well, I would say. Uh, it worked perfectly now with our session, and uh, yeah, so from my side, just uh, thanks a lot to everybody, and uh, hope to see you Thursday. Uh, have a nice uh, afternoon, or evening, or whatever. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Ja, schade, ne? dass wir nicht essen gehen können in Rom. Ja. Das wäre schön gewesen, aber lässt sich nur mal nicht machen. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich erinnere mich dann noch gern dran zurück. Das war, war ja. sehr nett. War immer schön, ne? Ja, okay. Aber so können wir wenigstens ja. virtuell in Rom sein. Und uns, ja. Das stimmt, aber es fehlt uns die Atmosphäre hier. Ne? Ja. 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 Hoffentlich geht das bald wieder. Ja, genau. Hoffe ich. Hoffe ich sehr. Okay, dann also tschüss. Ciao. Ich ende das mal. <lacht>